Hello, everybody. This is Dylan. And this is Fortune, also known as a restless mind on YouTube. And welcome to episode nine of Sin Discussion. We have yes. been uh, a couple busy bees this last uh, couple of weeks. And we've yeah. been out to the theaters a couple times. <laughs> A little too busy. Um, I'm kind of addicted to New World. It's my first MMO, and I am. I had. I told myself that I was going to take a week off of my YouTube channel to play New World because I knew I needed to get into it in the beginning. And uh, this week, I'm getting started back on my YouTube videos where I left off, and I'm constantly like tempted to go play that game. So I have to control myself. <laughs> Jeez, five minute rule, man. Just start start working on the video for like five minutes, and that should get you through like a session. You'll you'll keep doing it. <laughs> well, I am working. I'm working on my midnight mass uh, deep dive slash video essay, so it's going well. I have the script started. I'm a few paragraphs in, so it's going well. So. It would be so easy to dedicate a whole episode to that show. In fact, it'd be so easy. I'm going to try not to go on a tangent right now because we have a lot to talk <laughs> yeah, about. Yeah, that that'll be maybe our next episode because by then I'll have my the YouTube video about out and maybe we could talk about it too because I know we only have so much time. So just you guys know today, uh, because we saw both films, today's theme is we're actually going to play 20 questions. We have 20 questions that we've written out for each person. Um, everything appropriate. <laughs> uh, but just it, we thought it would be fun for you guys because you guys will probably get to know each of us a little bit better through our answers to these questions and we might even get to know each other a little bit better maybe stuff we didn't know uh, but before that we are going to discuss uh daniel craig's send-off in 007's no time to die as well as let there be carnage so dylan yeah uh let's start with no time to die and it's actually called venom let there be carnage i don't want just uh, I, how horrendous of a title that is to be I'm misconstrued just, as I'm something just that call could be it. better <laughs> no, I'm just gonna call it "Let There Be Carnage." <laughs> it's just not what it's called. But it's, okay. it's the only the only reason I saw the film was because Carnage is finally in a movie, so that's what I'll call. It. As a matter of fact, fine, I'll just call it Carnage. <laughs> Jeez. Um, let's start with uh, the one I think we liked a little more. So we saw uh, 007 No Time to Die finally after yes. uh, almost two years of delays, which is yes, a pretty wild ride. If you were I excited know. and anticipating. Uh, we were both movie. super bummed like two years ago when it got pushed back and then it just kept getting pushed back so yeah and it, and as the pandemic kept going like right we we're coming to the end of it we we're like yes we're wrapping this up <laughs> vaccines are out we're about to open up again bam delta variant awesome. <laughs> right, so we'll and you're continue. like fine we're just gonna die and go see the movie <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> all right i'll i'll suffer a bit. um but yeah man i i re there was i really liked this movie um it was a little bit of a mixed bag for me i do have kind of a few things that i didn't love but as a as a final kind of farewell to the daniel craig era i think it was uh had a really great feeling of nostalgia not only for daniel craig's era of james bond movies but a lot of respect and kind of reverence for what came before it too which was really fun and cheerful and i think my favorite part about this movie uh was twofold uh one daniel craig's performance uh we we were texting the other day and i was like this is the best yeah. he's ever been as the character they gave him a lot of really great emotional stuff to work with in this movie and yeah. if he's been tired of playing this character like we've heard uh i couldn't tell it seemed no. like he really was putting his all into it and the other thing i've seen uh, a lot of movies over the past I think it's probably been like six months, maybe a little less, maybe a little more since I've started going back to the theaters uh, whenever yeah. I got vaccinated. Uh, but this was the first movie where it felt like I was really back in the theaters watching a blockbuster experience to see in theaters. Like this was the big yeah. one for me. You know yeah. what I mean? I think it's because it's the one that you were waiting for most throughout quarantine that got pushed back. Like a lot of the other ones we've seen are, are films that... You know, we were we were looking forward to seeing, but I think this is one of the the first film that's been released that we were both like been waiting since for two years, literally for this movie. Like for me, the other mm -hmm. one now is The Matrix Resurrections, and mm -hmm. uh, and also Scream, just because I'm a Scream fan. So, which they are yeah. releasing the trailer tomorrow, apparently. So I'm super Ooh, excited. I, I meant to send it to you the other day. I saw the uh, the poster for the film. Yeah, uh, you may have seen it. Looks, it and I was it like, looks great, of course. Poster. I'm a Scream yeah. fanatic, even the ones that aren't as good. Like I just, <laughs> and this is the first one that. You know, R.I.P. Wes Craven. This is the first one not directed by him. It's directed by the two guys that did Ready or Not, which I thought was a fun movie. So, like, we'll, we'll see too. how this goes. So I like Ready or Not a lot. I actually didn't know that, and that gives me uh, even mm -hmm. more excitement because that movie and I think had they a wrote really it. fun tone think, as well. Yeah, I think they were some of the writers, too, on it. So, Sweet. like, so, so it should be fun. It should be interesting to see what they do with it. And a lot cool. of the actors have said in Twitter, uh, uh, like, interviews and things like that, that he really worked hard to, like, respect Wes Craven throughout the film. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I can't wait. 
Yeah, I can't wait either. Um, as for No Time to Die, uh, I, I kind of went over the things I love. A th- couple things that didn't work for me is I think they got an amazing actor with the Remy Malik to play the final villain. And he very much felt just kind of like a Bond villain. Uh, and what I mean by that is if you've seen the series, you know, it's very often that villains pop up. They get way too little to do. They have a big, giant world ending. Yeah you know, plan to go on and they're not always the most memorable. And this was one of those villains for me, which was frustrating because he actually had one of my favorite intros to a Bond villain. It almost felt like I was watching like The Strangers or some like home invasion movie. I was like, oh shit, this is about to be legit. (laughs) Yeah, like like, like the opening, I I, I liked that whole thing. And I Mm -hmm. liked, and I remember I was actually just, the scene with the ice, I was literally just waiting to see what he did. Yeah. And the way it goes, at first I thought, oh, wow. And then you realize, oh, that's not what's happening. (laughs) And I was like, okay. But, like, honestly, you know what it reminded me of? It almost reminded me of, like, the sequence in, uh, like, a longer version of the sequence from The Kingsman, where they're, like, Mm -hmm. in the cabin, and then, like, someone just shows up. (laughs) It's kind of like that. It did like that. (laughs) Just a little bit, but but less humorous and fun, more actual kind of, you know, dread, like, what's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, I also liked the... um, uh, Okay, so just so you guys know, so no time to die, no two spoils. I'll just say I like the scene that involved. I was surprised by the gun play. <laughs> I'll just say somebody did something, and I was very shocked. I was like, "Good for you!" <laughs> and I think you know what I mean. Uh, yeah. Like I did not expect that, and I was like, "Yes!" I'm sure my friends down in Texas would be like, "See, see." <laughs> uh but yeah like i really liked it too um i'm with you i feel like the villain was for me extremely weak and unfortunately i think rami malik malik is great um and Mm -hmm. the villain was the best bond films tend to have good villains Like, like, like they tend to be memorable because the villain is a huge part of the show they interweave themselves into the story to the point where it actually elevates the mystery and it elevates um i guess the uneasiness about how it's going to end based on what the villain's motivations are and how it's affecting either bond or someone around bond directly like in the sense of skyfall it affects bond indirectly because well it's directly for him but like it's about m essentially but that affects bond directly because whether he likes to see it or not m wasn't just a boss she was kind of like a mother figure for him in a way too because he doesn't really seem to have any family members like he he cared about M, and then in Le Chief, yeah. Le Chief is just he just and you know, Mads Mikkelsen just eats up the screen when he's on the screen so he's yeah. just you know what I mean like um and I feel like both uh Quantum of Solace and Spectre which are two films that I thought were uh far less good I didn't think they were great films um I do love um I do love that Spectre had some very good actors to play the villains, but it's another situation where I feel like they're kind of underused, underexposed, and they're not as connected to the story. Like it almost seemed like they tried to make Spectre seem like the villain was connected to the connected to the story by just basically having him say that all these things were me and they've led up to here. But that doesn't mean anything. That's just cheating. Yeah. You're just saying it. You're not showing it and making us feel it. Like if that was the case, there should have been a vein of this underlying thing through all the films if that's true like almost like what they did with the sherlock series with moriarty where he's kind Mm -hmm. of it's been building up to this meeting you know it's never like that so it was kind of a cheat that's why i thought specter was a bit disappointing but for this one even though i i didn't care for the villain there was enough with bond uh with his relationship with certain characters a few reveals also i like the way they handled um the new actress who comes in, I think her name is uh, Lashana Lynch. She was uh, yeah. she was also in uh, Captain Marvel, um, but I believe. But mm-hmm. I like she comes right. in as Nomi. Nomi, and uh, I think she's great. And I like the because a lot of people like freaked out online about oh she's she's not supposed to be double seven. Double seven is typically a guy. And I also understand that argument not in terms of sexism or anything, but like, but like I like the constant joke that like it's just a number. Who cares? You know, <laughs> like there, there's like this joke, and then at the end. I think those fans would have to shut their mouths because like, you know, the fact that she actually gives the number back out of respect, like, like, so it shows all the while they are respecting that character of Bond and like people just need to wait until they see movies before they freak out. You know what I mean? But um, yeah, yeah. I remember yeah. it's actually, I think I, I'm a little grateful that this movie had some time before it came out. Cause I remember a lot of headlines where it was, you know, that 007 conversation of who should be 007. And I think, yeah. Uh, people were upset that Phoebe Waller-Bridges was going to be a writer on the project. And I was like, these people have yeah. clearly never seen Fleabag. <laughs> I know, right? Seriously. Dude, I was like, so you people are idiots. You just saw a woman and got mad. Like, I don't I don't know what else what to is- say. Like, Fleabag is not 
there's nothing about that that makes it too feminine or too masculine it is hilarious it is brilliant yeah. it is rated r as hell yeah. and it's it's honestly just absolutely brilliant i anything she wants to be involved with i i'm happy to see <laughs> like and, literally like and, and there it's can so be crazy meaningful fantastic conversation around what inclusion and diversity means in film and maybe we'll even get into yeah. that one day but before the art is released and people have a chance to really take it in it's all hypothetical and exactly. hypothetical conversations lead to misplaced and hypothetical anger and people have valid reasons for that too but when it comes to art experience it and then discuss it exactly you know? it's like until you've seen it your opinion is completely just speculation and at this point getting so upset and being rude to other people and stuff when you don't when you haven't even seen the damn project is actually pointless and it's really yeah. mature frankly yeah. like it just is like i can uh, understand seeing a trailer and being like i have no interest in seeing that movie fine but at that mm -hmm. point you still it's hard for you to judge it when you haven't seen it though like there are films i haven't seen because i don't have any interest but i don't have much to say about them because i didn't see to confirm my opinions you know like so right. like if you asked me i didn't see it i didn't really want to see it it's kind of that simple like you know yeah. <laughs> like... um <laughs> but i do think a, a fair critique of the writing was this movie uh kind of juggled a lot of tones it juggled that kind I of agree. casino royale tone of really gritty gritty serious moments especially within the action there were i think three or four really phenomenal violent exciting yes. set pieces in this movie there was the uh the car chase i think was it in rome in the beginning that we've yeah. been seeing in the i think trailers. it was italy yeah i think it was somewhere in italy i just don't i don't know yeah i'm not sure what city it was in though like that's right it sounded that it scene, sounded like they were it sounded like they were speaking italian but i could be wrong yeah yeah that scene uh lived up to the hype um we saw most of it in the trailers unfortunately but there's still some excitement there oh uh, yeah the, it's cut beautifully and honestly carrie Fuk, uh, fukunaga is a great director so like the shot list is beautiful. I mean, I remember throughout yeah. that whole sequence, even when he comes to visit a grave and stuff, like that, it's just beautiful. Like it's it's yeah. he's a very good director and he knows what he wants, you know. Yeah, there great. was a another one of my favorite kind of set pieces was uh, there's a scene where Bond goes to a club and he's infiltrating uh, <laughs> a kind of a society with another character that leads to a really exciting action scene where uh, yeah. Uh, Amadea Moss really gets to show off how badass she is in the movie. And yeah, something that cool. I absolutely loved is especially when the Bond theme kicks in and everything's violent, he's always walking out in a structured tuxedo like Michael Myers, yeah. just completely yeah. calm <laughs> and stiff and just blowing yeah. people away. I was like, this movie's so fucking cool, man. Yeah. And I think that was one of the few campy moments that I liked, the the scene where after all of that he still pours them a drink. It just feels yeah. very Bond. I yeah. think that was like the that was like the one campy joke that landed really well for me. I was like, okay, yeah. Like, like I feel like there are definitely some since he's saying goodbye, it seemed like it was deliberate. There was a little more campiness to kind of, you know, say to kind of hit on some of those notes that some of the older fans liked as well. Like, you know, because yeah. he has been the more serious Bond. So I think they just wanted to give them a little bit of that old, you know, wink, winking at the camera kind of thing, you know, just yeah. a little bit. Yeah. So. Uh, there was the all too brief, but amazing shootout within the foggy woods. That was um, one of my favorite sequences. I loved it so yeah, much. Yeah, I loved Especially it too. I wish it would have gone on for longer. And I know. I was like, ah, oh, they left me wanting more. <laughs> I'll just say, I'll just, and one of the shots is actually shown in the trailer, and I still loved seeing it again. It's the scene with the tripwire in the van, and yeah, he still, he, he still gets the few shots off. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yep. <laughs> and, and and what that what how that ends with. A specific person that irritated the hell out of me, um, included especially one of my favorite lines. He smiles too much. I was like, "Yes, yeah. it's so ass. irritating! <laughs> it's so irritating." Yeah. yeah, it sounds like an Archer character that you just want to die. <laughs> like, it really like, was. It, that's exactly what it was. Logan and Ash, then... Barry's brother. <laughs> like, <it's> like... <laughs> <laughs> that's all and I can think of. The uh, the final set piece on the the big island. There's a a really yeah. great oneer of uh, Daniel. Oh Bay yeah. Fighting up a flight of stairs and you just see yeah. how incredibly physical he is in this role and i know he's talked about how many injuries he's just sustained working in this yeah. role and on these films so he definitely kind of takes it easier than he has in the past on like casino but that scene really showed him putting for that sure. physicality, physicality yeah. to the test and, and i'm pretty really sure i know exactly where the cut is for the stunt double by the way like yeah I know exactly, you know where it is too <laughs> yeah, like it's I like it was right there but it's seamless it's perfect like it yeah. works ju just like birdman you're sure that's yes. where it was but it, you, you wouldn't really be able to know for like you know but right it, it was great they did a very good job with it yeah um, um but then it, you know where i think uh i was listening to carrie fukunaga talk about this film and 
He was explaining that Bond films are rarely ever going to come out in time, especially in this area era, because for the most part, they're they're right, continuing to write it even as they've begun editing. And he said yeah. that's been a consistent on almost all the films. And you can actually feel that in this movie. You can feel you can. where you one can. writer leaves, another comes in. The tone just kind of gets lost every once in a while. And yeah. it didn't like kill the movie for me, but it definitely kind of docked it a little bit. Um, yeah. But I mean, that's that, that, okay. It was still a blast. Yeah, I think that's what I had said to you. I thought it was a good movie, not a great movie, but it's a good movie. And I still enjoyed it. I thought it was super well directed. I thought some of the action scenes were great. I'd love seeing Daniel Craig in the role. Like you said, I agree. His performance was fantastic fantastic i always just i'll just say no spoilers i always wish something more happened with uh, uh money penny to some extent i just yeah. can't i can't help it uh, especially after skyfall like i just couldn't mm-hmm. help it but um i think that leia is it sidu C- or sidu sidu mm-hmm. um she's fantastic she actually in our last episode we talked about um blue is the warmest color that was i think yep. the first time i had ever seen her um and she blew me away then, and she's always great. Like, I feel like she's one of those characters, she's one of those actresses that, whatever the role is, she's just very believable in it, which which is great. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like she's not she's not overly showy. She doesn't really steal the screen, but her character's not supposed to. But she's yeah. completely genuine in everything that she does, and I believe her. Like, I really liked the scene with the daughter when she's being pulled away from her daughter. Like, I liked that scene quite a bit. Um, and I yeah. like that, and I like that it seems like the writers, directors were very specific to not make her a victim she's never a victim even with what's Mm -hmm. happening she surprises you over and over again and i like that i like that i like that i like that she's like a strong woman and 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 even though she's not played as like the agent she's like you don't have to be an agent to just to just be brave and just not be stupid you know what i mean and i I like that i like that she's given that credit throughout the film you know what i mean so totally totally um but yeah i I think if uh you've been waiting for a particular movie to get out and have that theatrical experience with, and you're feeling safe and responsible. I think this is a, this is a great pick to do that. In fact, uh, I agree. as a quick ranking of kind of where I would put this one, the Daniel Craig era, I was going to uh, do mine too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so mine are, uh, Casino and Skyfall are interchangeable. My opinion changes on what's one and two all the time. So for mm-hmm. now today, I'm going to say Skyfall and Casino, but tomorrow I might reverse that. Uh, then no time to die is three. Uh, yep. And those are the three I'll rewatch again and again. Uh, Basically, as far yeah. as Spectre and Quantum, I saw them once, didn't care much for him. Those are my yeah, four yeah, for, for, yeah, yeah, yeah. For for me, it's pretty much the exact same. If I ordered it specifically, the, uh, well, not actually, no. Uh, as much as I love Skyfall, I, Casino Royale is my number one, and then Skyfall, and then mm-hmm. No Time to Die, and then I would say Spectre, and then uh, Quantum Solace. But Spectre and Quantum Solace, I saw each one. I never need to watch them again. I didn't think they were very good. So <laughs> yeah. No Time to Die, I think is solid. I didn't love it, but I didn't hate it. I think it's solid. I could definitely watch it again, and I probably will. So sweet. And it's definitely a fun send off. And I think they did a lot of things justice while honoring a lot of um, things about the character that people love, while still trying to bring in some new ideas to some extent, which I think is nice. So I agree. Shout out to James Bond. They are, uh, whoever comes next is going to have some very large shoes to fill. Yep, Daniel Craig is still my favorite Bond. Like I, I think he, nice there's too. just a realism that he brings to the role that he's like a Bond that it's not as showy and corny. Like I believe him. Like I, you know, yeah. and I, I appreciate that. So yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, what did you think of the sequel to Venom? Uh, Venom, Let There Be Carnage. You, you mean Carnage? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Carnage starring Woody Harrelson. <laughs> 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 no, uh, so Dylan and I both didn't really think the first Venom was very good. Um, I basically didn't expect this to be very good, but I wanted to see it just because Carnage is one of my favorite villains. Um, I think he's really cool looking. I think that, you know, he's always a side villain, but I just always wanted to see him in a movie. So it could be good or bad. I'm going to go see the movie. Um, yeah. I think some of the Carnage scenes were kind of cool. Uh, the only issue is just like the first one, it's like really overly CG looking. Like I know you would have to make him CG for the most part, but I feel like um the style in which the cg was used is very much like the first one in the sense that in a lot of lighting it feels very cartoony which Mm -hmm. i don't care for because i feel like i know you can go with more of a photorealistic look um but overall i mean if you're a fan let me put it this way i think if you really liked the first one i'm like almost 100 percent certain you will really like this one like it because it has almost Mm -hmm. the exact same tone you know it follows up on the last movie almost exactly in the same way similar kinds of humor if you can call it that um well like there, there are moments where i did laugh but like most of the laughter like some of it was funny but some of it i was, I was, I was just laughing because that was supposed <laughs> to be a joke if that makes sense yeah. there's also honestly but here's the thing for me 
ironically, it is one of my favorite movies that I've seen all year because of one line. There is a line in this film that is so bad Wait. that you, you cannot believe that someone wrote it professionally and that it ended up in a movie. And I loved it. I actually hurled over in my seat. I was laughing and I actually had to try to contain myself. So I was... Did that line alone? It, I am grateful for seeing this yes. movie. Yes. I have to Don't be honest. Don't say what it is. Don't say I what won't it is. say what it is because I want you guys. I want to see if you guys have the same feeling I had. Yeah. I, I was like, at first, I was like, I was like expecting someone to say it, and then I thought it was going to get quiet, and then everyone in the room was going to start laughing and like say, "What was that?" or something. But it was serious. It was just <laughs> it like was a real serious. moment. And I was like, and I was literally like. I think I bumped you, didn't I? Like elbow you, <laughs> yeah. and I was like, I was just thinking, this is amazing. This is amazing. Like this is the best thing ever. So, so I enjoyed my experience, but not for the reasons the writers and directors expected me to. That's what I would say. Like if, if I had to grade yeah. it, it's 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 not the worst thing I've ever seen, but it's definitely an oh boy, you know. <laughs> like <it's laughs> yeah, um, where I'm at, I don't like this series. Um, Neither do I. I'll tell you what, you know, I was talking to uh, my fiance on the road home, and I was like, I imagine that, like, if I had kids and they were like 10 to 12, like, I'm a huge fan of the character Venom, and I feel like this yeah. would be like a fun thing to share in that regard. But also, yeah, as a fan of the character, this isn't what I want to see. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, the jokes don't land for me. The, no. uh, what made me laugh at the end of the first Venom was seeing Woody Harrelson in like a Ronald McDonald wig saying yeah. I'm Carnage. And I was like, yeah. I mean, great actor. They made him get a haircut. And uh, you see him in this movie and they're doing their best. But the entire time it's, I don't get, I mean, I do get the tone. It's just as I'm watching it, I'm like, man, these are not for me. Like these are just no. for somebody else. Yeah. I will say I do have one positive. For a PG-13 version of Carnage, I thought there was going to be a significantly less amount of on-screen Carnage. Like, you really do get some cool stuff going on with you him, do. like, spreading the symbiote throughout, like, entire buildings and just I thought the prison causing a sequence. whole lot of mayhem. Yeah. and Yeah, the For prison sure. sequence. I think the prison sequence was probably the best scene in the movie. It was, I didn't think it was amazing, but it was solid. Like, it had some cool stuff to it. Um, and if you're a Carnage yeah. fan, and if you're a Carnage fan, there's some ridiculous stuff that, you know, if you have read some of the comics, it's ridiculous, but you you get it. Like, you know, yeah. like, it's like, all right, cool. Yeah. Um, that it has, it has a, a kind of an exciting post uh, mid credit sequence that we're not going to spoil, but um, <laughs> there's another know. one that's like, what the fuck was that? Yeah. I found out what that is, by the way, and it's hilarious. Really? <laughs> yeah, but I don't want to tell you here because it's a spoiler for anybody who wants to see it. So I'll tell you later. My friend right. who knows, my friend who was with me knows comics, so he went and researched. He was like, "What the f- is that?" And then he was like, "Oh God, it's." And then he told me, and I couldn't stop laughing. So I'll tell you later. <laughs> <laughs> well we'll uh we'll see where the the series goes forward after this but it may go in some really cool directions or, or maybe not we'll, yeah well, well based on one sequence it looks like it has the potential to be cool if it well i don't want to spoil it so i'll just say it has the potential to be cool in the right hands i'll just say that yeah <laughs> we'll, yeah we'll see. we will see that's really all i got for carnage i, I would recommend it um no if anyone, would I. you know some there are some people may enjoy it but that you know I just want to kind of transition into my first question of 20 questions. And I took a lot of care writing this one. (laughs) And I mean it very seriously. I'm not joking. Okay. Okay. So question one, guys, we are getting into 20 questions now. What do secrets want and why are they so hard to keep? (laughs) Secrets don't want anything, so they should be easy to keep. (laughs) That's <laughs> my answer. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> that movie might disagree, but I see where you're coming from. <laughs> I'm not going to explain this further, guys, because it's something that I want. <laughs> the answer. The correct answer, Fortune. It's okay. The correct answer is this is the worst fucking line in the history of filmmaking. <laughs> and I love it. I'm so happy. And it's in the right movie. Like, that's it's in the right movie. It is in the right. <laughs> you actually made that a question. I love you so much. <laughs> had, to, had to make a little ice cream. Oh, man. That is so good. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so like, sorry. In retrospect, spoilers. <laughs> like, I guess. I guess. <laughs> The uh, okay. the answer audience is secrets are hard to keep because they want out. No, 
That is not the right answer. That is the correct. That answer. is never the right answer. And that's the problem. That told me. And that's the not. <laughs> 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 Damn it, Dylan! <laughs> like, <I can't. laughs> okay, okay. I'm so sorry, guys. I'm trying to control myself here. Okay, my first question, which is more of an actual one. <laughs> wow. <laughs> i can't believe you did that but i love you brother <laughs> like i appreciate you man uh, <laughs> uh question what is the origin of your passion for films oh good question um the origin for my passion of films would be uh, i don't know how unique this is but i share a lot of experiences with uh what I imagine many kids growing up with a single parent was like in that, mm -hmm. you know, life growing up, we, we don't recognize how, how difficult it is until um, we get older and kind of reflect on what that experience was like with more context into the world. And 100%. what I didn't know at the time was I really loved escapism and it, it's carried in, it's carried into my adulthood. But, you know, I grew up, uh, I grew up on movies and I, I was raised in front of a television like a lot of people in my generation, you know? Uh, yep, me too. So I, I naturally learned what good and evil and positivity and morals kind of felt like a lot through the television. And that, uh, that led to my love of reading and eventually my love of uh, video games of just being able to understand other people's experiences through fictional characters. You know what I mean? I think that it's uh, made me a more caring person, far more empathetic, far more understanding, and in a lot of ways, far more patient um, outside of that escapism as well, because I think it led to my fascination with other people's experiences. And, you know, as yeah. I reflected on that more and more, that's made me love film even more, and it's made me love film in different ways. Also, um, I'm a pretty... Uh, my 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 tone, the way I speak, and a lot of the time, my kind of emotions, they're pretty even keeled and low. But I feel I've had, outside of certain like major life events, when it comes to feeling art, I've always felt it the most in film. The combination of visuals and performances and music has always kind of pulled that out of me, more so than anything individually. And that's yeah. kind of just led to years and years. Of, of love for this art i can relate to that very very nice answer thank you yeah that's awesome yeah. thank you that was a great question thank you my uh, my first one for you would be uh if you could take one movie um to see again as if it's your experience for the first time watching it what would you choose and why oh that's a good one if it was for the first time yeah, something that you could experience for the first time again, and kind of tell me a little bit about the first time you experienced that and why you. Okay, want to so go back it would it. it would be uh, there's a few films on my list. I'm sure you know I'd pick. For me, it would be the first Scream film. Mm -hmm. um, I love that film, and the reason I would love to experience it again um, for the first time was because when I saw that, I believe I was 14, and my mom was still heavily into the church, so she really didn't want me watching that kind of violent stuff. You know, so a lot of the rated R stuff, I had to kind of sneak on my own or with friends at their house or whatever. And I remember uh, my mom's friend came over and her daughter, they had just rented some movies from Blockbuster or Hollywood Video, one of those that us old people know about. Uh, and uh, Scream was one of them. And uh, the parent, my, pa my mother was preoccupied with her friends so essentially, I was just like, hey, mom, can I watch this movie? And I just kind of made sure not to explain it too much, <laughs> you know? And she was like, yeah, sure, you guys have fun. And I was like, well, I got permission. So, <laughs> so I proceeded to watch this film that, till this day, it's one of my favorite opening sequences in any film. I think it was so well directed, so well performed. Um, I thought the score was beautiful. Also, most slashers, I had still seen a lot of them at that point secretly, but they usually involved really stupid characters and really stupid people, and it's basically just there to see them die, and there's nothing else interesting about the script. So the idea that it was essentially this murder mystery thing, and you're trying to figure out who the killer is, and 
the fact that the opening scene has this kind of really poetic darkness to it, which I had never experienced emotionally. Um, yeah. You know, the idea that she's choked and then she gets away and her parents are right in front of her and she can't call for help because she's her throat doesn't work. And then she's literally dying right on the other side of the wall, holding the phone. You know, there's just so many elements to that that I didn't know you could write a sequence like that and still have something awful be beautiful, like in a film storytelling way so um i would love to have been able to have seen that at that time like in a theater with friends with like the surround sound and really experience that fear for the first time you know what i mean because yeah. the score is so great with it blaring and you know like just to have been allowed to see that in the theater i think i would have loved that opening sequence even more because till this day it's in my mind all the time and it's kevin williamson as a writer his style has influenced me he's probably one of my top three to five like writer you know influencers so um yeah, I would pick that one just because of how much it still influences me to this day. So that only would have probably made the experience better. Yeah, I, I love Wes Craven. I think he has still done my favorite work in kind of that non-comedy meta horror genre with Scream yeah. and like New Nightmare, where it's very self-aware, oh, but they're still yeah. scary. And they're still New messed great. up. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure new nightmare is great like honestly i think nightmare on elm street and nightmare were the best ones like those were hands down the best ones so for sure yeah yeah awesome I'm, yeah thanks that was a good yeah. one that was fun i had to oh, think well, about it <laughs> i was like i was like part of me wants to say one of these oscar winning films because it sounds smart but i'm like if i'm being honest <laughs> we're being like, honest today yeah we're being honest so <laughs> <laughs> all right let's see here if there is one movie that you could see remade well, what would it be? Ooh. And I mean that by, yeah. like, something that you love that you'd love to see a remake of or something that was bad that you thought was a great idea that could have been great, you know? You asked the anti-remake person this, did you? <laughs> yes, I did, and I did that deliberately. Right. <laughs> let, me, uh, let, me, let me ponder this one for a second. Sure. If I had to remake a movie and see it from today's viewpoint, I think I would, but a good director would have to do it. My curiosity would skyrocket to see today's version of A Clockwork Orange. Ooh, what yeah. a good one. Yeah, I think Who that, would do uh, this? You know who I think would have to do it? Who? Just my opinion, David Fincher. David Fincher would be excellent. I think uh, Denis Villeneuve would be really good too. Um, yeah, I, I could see that too. I could yeah. see that too. But I think the the conversation in that movie around kind of acceptance of violence and the way that it affects us and can it be can it be fixed through you know uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Can it be a uh, fixed through uh, um, I'm looking for the word. Not well, yeah, conditioning. I'm going to pause. Let me get the dogs out of here. One second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Oops. You got to stop, baby. Okay. Go lay down. Go lay down. Go on. Go lay down. No. Hi, Fortune. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, not only through conditioning, but through... Um, I'm looking for the word. Uh, unfortunately, I can't find it. But... Let me just restart this whole scene. Because uh... Uh, I would be able to find it, but I got sure. real distracted. There. No problem. Um, but yeah, it'd be a clockwork orange, because I'd want no, yeah, to see... No, yeah, I totally get it. I'd want to be able to see kind of that conversation of how violence portrayed in the media as well as other topics affecting young people through today's point of view um through yeah i guess the word would be conditioning um and i think that our culture has evolved in so many ways since that movie is made and taken such leaps and bounds from where we were but you know sure. from the topic those conversations are very much still alive and well and I, i'd be curious to see yeah today's point of view from an artist compared to Stanley Kubrick's point of view. Yeah, I think that's not a great that, answer, not, actually. Not that that would be really took a stance in that movie. I think it didn't feel like he took a stance, but... No, I, I think he was very good to just make the film as um, honest and 
kind of off and on visceral as possible. I like, like, like it's like visceral while still being operatic at times. It's, it's really interesting. I love it. Like it's so good. Yeah, I agree. Who, uh, my next question for you would be which, uh, quote bad director, or at least poorly reviewed director has a body of work that you just really enjoy. Oh man, that's a tough one. Um, I'm gonna give you my answer because this was one of those questions. I, I already know ask. what I already, know, I already know what yours is. I like Rob Zombie movies, Fortune. <laughs> <laughs> it was gonna be that or it was gonna be that or Zack Snyder because some people don't like Zack Snyder. Oh, so yeah, no, I was I, wondering. I was wondering which <laughs> enough people like him that that's fine. Rob yeah, Zombie no. movies. Mine's, mine's Rob Zombie. <laughs> I think he has a very clear creative direction and a unique cinematic voice. Uh. Oh, that's just hard. (laughs) Oh, give me a second here. Yep. One jumps to mind because I like a few of his movies. Um, Okay. Um, Not so much lately, (laughs) (laughs) but in the past, I mean, (laughs) because I'm trying to be honest here. Uh, not so much lately. Well, I guess technically there's kind of two, but it's kind of like I like some of their films. Uh, mm-hmm. I would say M. Night Shyamalan, just because he gets a lot of crap, but there are some movies he's done in the past that I thought were fantastic, and some yeah. that are terrible, terrible. Another person that I don't know if I'd say they're fantastic, but I like some quite a bit is Paul W.S. Anderson. His early work, I love. I like the first Mortal Kombat a lot. I thought Event Horizon was decent. I thought the oh, first Resident yeah. Evil was good. I thought the first Resident Evil was actually pretty good. Didn't like Alien vs. Predator. Um, I didn't like any of the other Resident Evil movies. I didn't see the last one, but there was one right in the middle called Retribution. Randomly enjoyed that one. And I also didn't hate Death Race. I thought Death Race was all right. So, I thought Death um, Race was kind of dope. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of like well, yeah, like it had some <laughs> like it was kind of stupid, but it also had some cool stuff to it. And he has this kind of clean look that he goes for that. You know, as a director, you got to give him credit. He's mastered it. He has a very clean, sterile look that that it's very pretty. He just doesn't always make my favorite movies. But I'd say both of those films have done some things that I like. So I'll I'll put them in there. I don't I wouldn't say I love either of them because of some of the really bad ones, but they've mm-hmm. done some that I like. So yeah, I will say as uh, good as the first Mortal Kombat movie is, there was no reason that no, this year's version shouldn't have been better than it. <laughs> it no none whatsoever and the worst part is that first 10 minutes is actually fantastic so it's like you showed me you could do it and then you just were like Bro. nah <laughs> yeah, exactly jeez got shang Tsung walking around looking like somebody's auntie dude oh my god and then every time you cut to outworld it feels like it's an snl skit of mortal kombat yeah. like it's so bad i was like what why is outworld so terrible like i mean that I, I thought the first like half hour was pretty good like sub-zero chasing around people like a serial killer you know raising ice and chase you know like i thought that was a cool concept but about the half hour to 40 minute mark basically once they got to raiden's temple it just went downhill dramatically and it never recovered and all the fight never. sequences uh, were just pretty crappy after that too. Like all of them were really, really bad. So yeah. But uh, like Sc- Scorpion Sub Zero was okay, but it was still not amazing. Sorry. Apparently it was highly successful, so we'll probably catch that. It sequel. was. I'm also a little bitter because uh, Johnny Scorpion and uh, um, oh my god, I have I love quite a few characters, but Johnny and Scorpion are two of my favorites, and Johnny was not in this movie, so I was really sad. But we'll it sounds like he's no, it sounds sounds like he's gonna be in the second one. So yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Okay. Uh what subjects are you most drawn to in storytelling? Mm, good one. Um I am a huge fan. Did you say genre in storytelling? M- what subjects, subjects are you drawn to most in storytelling? Yeah. Got it. Um I like films whether it be like in a small character story or like a large intergalactic story i like really big themes i like movies that deal with life and death love and hatred um faith and uh non-faith i like movies that tackle these really kind of difficult big conversations regardless of how they do it even if it's something like uh, it immediately goes to books one of my favorite authors is cormac mccarthy and he has yeah, uh, a I lot of really love. really heavy books one of which is 
uh, Blood Meridian, which is an mm-hmm. incredibly violent book. I don't recommend it to everybody, but if you have a if you have a tough stomach, then uh, high recommendation. But it's a the I've never seen war and violence explored in a way where it's felt so visceral, but so philosophical at the same time. And if a story can make me feel that way about mm. something big, then I tend to really gravitate towards it. I also have a particular love for movies that take place in the American West a lot of times, regardless of times. I think there is a mm-hmm. like a feeling of like legend and mythos in like westerns and, and especially gothic westerns i'm really drawn to because i love horror and kind of darkness and that um but i think when a movie can or a movie a show a story can deal with a big theme uh then it, i tend to very quickly fall in love with it the most recent which was uh dealing with faith and midnight mass and the way that it can affect a small community yeah um, i immediately fell God, in love with it so you know good I mean? yeah me too it's 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 my favorite my uh, uh mike flanagan project ever now it, i love it i think yeah. it's a masterpiece i genuinely do i do too so i think um even regardless of the tone of the movie or the topic i really enjoy a heavy heavy theme it could be like mm-hmm. a light comedy but if that light comedy is dealing with what it means to be alive or something or you know fear of death all of those things like even funny enough even though it's not a great movie i have a certain love for click because when that movie starts to wrap up, you start dealing with these really heavy themes of how did you spend your life? And I was like, yeah, this stupid movie got me. <laughs> 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 but I think, I think that's the, uh, that's the ticket for me. It just has to have a really, really heavy, impactful theme. And then whatever they do with that, I'll, I'll be along for that. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. My next question for you, I have a whole list and I'm kind of picking the one I want to hit next. Sure. Um, Tell me a little bit about what is your favorite way to enjoy a movie? Um, that's actually, oh, so I have, I, I suppose I have two. Uh, one, obviously, is the theater. Like, I, 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 I'm a theater fan. Um, I'm not anti-movies coming straight to, you know, HBO or what have you, um, if people want to do that as well. I think both can exist together. Um, but I personally, I love the theater. I love the surrounds down. Um, but my favorite thing always has been, especially at home, I love having like some really good food and just like mm-hmm. kicking back on the couch and watching movie, like good food in a movie or a good TV show. And I'm really, really happy. Like that, that's one of my mm-hmm. happiest. And it's really, it's why I'm a big boy. I like food too much, but like <laughs> having some good food and a good movie, I'm just happy in both ways. Right. So um, yeah. one of my favorite things now is if I'm going out, I love like the theaters that like we go to sometimes where they serve food and stuff too. And you can like literally just eat and drink a milkshake or whatever while you're there watching a movie. I love that experience. I just, I just do like, um, yeah, it's like, it's like I'm, I'm fulfilling my my <laughs> it's like i'm feeling i'm not religious but the best way to put it it's almost like i'm refilling but i'm i'm fulfilling both of my spiritual needs at the same time <laughs> yeah like, yeah <laughs> it kind of feels like, like so like it's it's that simple for me like i'm if i ever do settle down with somebody you know i'm so easy to please good food and a good tv show or movie and i'm happy so yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. that's awesome. Same thing for me. If it's a if it's a big release or even a small release, if it's a big release, I like being in the crowd. If it's something that feels a little more yeah. personal, I like being in like a very quiet theater where people are far away from me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just being real, I like uh, you know I, I I'm you. that type of person where um, I still enjoy like going to the theaters alone every now and then or getting a meal alone. I'm oh very, yeah, for sure. I get very excited about uh. I have such a busy life a lot of the time that those moments of quiet you where do. I'm like, oh, my thoughts, there you are again. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So Yeah, I, and, there are, and there also is something that do, you're right about, like, the big movies. There's something that doesn't beat, like, especially if it's, like, an IP, like Harry Potter or Marvel, going to that midnight showing. Because you see yeah. all the costumes. You see the, the audience is so excited about every little thing. Like, till this day, one of my favorite moments was we were seeing one of the Harry Potters. And I saw them all, I think, at midnight. But we saw yeah. one of them, and, and the screen projector wasn't working correctly. 
So like 15, 20 minutes had gone by and they were still trying to get it to work. And the woman was so embarrassed that she was anxious and she kept coming in every like two minutes to tell us it'll just be a few more minutes. And by like <laughs> the last one, and by like the last one, one of the guys that had the Harry Potter cosplay on pointed his wand at her, wand at her. And when she started speaking, like as soon as she said a word, he was like, Expelliarmus! And the entire audience started laughing. And she just went, and I felt bad for her because she just went red in the face. Her head went down and she just walked out. And then, and then he was like, hey, it works! And everybody started laughing. <laughs> yep. But Just it was really a, great. So. It's the opportunity to be among people who love what you do. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, for sure. For Nothing sure. That's always great. Sometimes there are fans where you think you're a fan and then you're like, oh, that is a fan. My bad. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. for the most part, <laughs> uh, right. it, it feels like a, a moment of celebration. You know, yeah. even though you're all sitting in a room quiet or not quiet, it's a shared experience. <laughs> yeah. Just... So, yeah, there are moments where you're like, I'm a fan, and then they do crazy stuff in the audience, and you're like, I do not know these people. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like... Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I came here by accident. This was a mistake. Like, it's like... This isn't that black and white for an indie film I was looking for. <laughs> yeah, let me just get on out of here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Uh, when it comes to gaming... Are you more interested in story or gameplay and mechanics? Ooh. <laughs> Can I cop out of this one and say <laughs> that it's a combination of both? You um, can. You can. You know, to be fair, um, I'm a big fan of having gameplay mechanics integrate with what's going on in the story. Um, mm hmm. And what I mean by that is a lot of times in video games, what's what's exciting about them, and when you have a creative director who's who's doing things right, it's very difficult to maintain pace when you're giving somebody agency over a story. You know what I mean? Yes, yes. So directly integrating what you can do within the gameplay to what's been depicted in the story, I think is one of those things where it really just starts to you start to lose yourself in what is essentially repetition because video games are yeah. just constant gameplay loops. It's like, here's a very small sandbox of things you can do. Now, how many different situations can we put you in to keep that interesting? Exactly. You know I mean? Yeah, for sure. For uh, uh, one of the most recent games that I love and one of my favorite kind of, not necessarily storytelling, but world building that I've seen in a game that I can remember is Death Stranding, Hideo Kojima's game. In fact, I don't know if you yeah. ever got around to watching, I sent you the intro to that game because I know you love sci-fi storytelling too. And I have not seen the intro yet. I apologize. I've been obsessed with New World, so I've watched nothing. <laughs> That's okay. And uh, for any any fans of Hideo Kojima, you know that he's very overindulgent. Like he's, You can't tell the guy, no, he's going to do what he wants. So I'm like, I'm going to send Fortune this video to watch this intro. I know it's 45 minutes. It's fine. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> but, yeah, um, definitely going to be a bit before I see that. I'm too, yeah. too obsessed with New World at the moment. And now I yeah. just started Squid Game finally. So, well, What I mean is like a good example of what I mean is in that game, um, rain in that world that he's created is called Timefall. And whatever mm -hmm. rain falls on rapidly ages down to like the grass, if it falls on birds, if it falls on people, they, they rapidly age and they, they die. So oh, wow. you go through cutscenes and it has these like huge moments within like the story of the game, but then also the game is about traversal. So you'll be trying to get somewhere and all of a sudden it'll start to rain and you'll have to kind of do something completely different within your path to be able to complete that task within the game. And there's, there's dozens of things uh, within just that game, for example. But when I start to see things integrate in that way, I feel more engaged into what's going on in the story. Okay. That's a good answer. Yeah. I actually did not know that about the rain in that game. That's gnarly. Yeah. <laughs> that's, man, that's terrifying. <laughs> it's pretty sweet. And you know what's funny is like, it's a game literally about delivering packages, which isn't exciting. <laughs> you have to so the... you'll be walking and you're like, okay, I have to get from point A to point B, but now it's raining and the metal on my back is starting to rust. So how am I going to find <laughs> shelter or, you know, A, B, and C? It's just those things that you keep... This... You seems even like our, <laughs> this seems like our apocalyptic our apoc apocalyptic words are hard this seems like our apocalyptic uh future here in seattle because it likes to rain a lot and we have amazon yeah. here so this is gonna be the life of many of these employees pretty yeah, soon exactly i, I remember uh, <laughs> when that came out it was right before the pandemic <laughs> that uh uh my fiance jasmine she she watched me play that game she really liked watching it and then like once the pandemic started she was like kojima knew he knew <laughs> She, she, was right. she was right. She was right. 
Oh, but yeah. Man. I think uh, when they start to intersect, I think that's what gets me most excited. But okay. for the most part, I if I don't enjoy the gameplay, I still want to experience the story. There are times where I'll just watch it on YouTube or like catch a playthrough if I'm not having fun. So for I think sure. at the end, story is more important to me. But cool. I, I, I would like actually, I would actually cool. agree. I want good mechanics, but if it has great mechanics and the story is uninteresting, I won't finish it. So it's just how yeah. I am too. I'm the same way. Um, I have. Uh, a similar question to that so i'm all, i'm pretty much going to throw this back at you in a certain way my question was do you feel like movies games or tv shows tend to be more engaging to you? um i would say that um each of them engages me in a different way if that makes mm-hmm. sense um so for film film is a director's medium while television is a writer's medium so mm-hmm. essentially when i'm going to see a film more often i'm going to see a director that I love, an ensemble of, you know, uh, an ensemble of a cast and crew, including the director that I love. Um, I am hoping for a great story, of course, but a lot of times when it comes to movies, directors uh, and people whose work I want to see what they do with the camera and how their perspective on how they tell the story is what I'm more excited about. And in TV shows, sometimes you have great directors too, but in TV mm-hmm. shows, it's a writer's medium. So what I love about television is that a lot of times they tackle things that are a little bit more taboo or they get deeper into the subject matter and the characters than a film can because they have more time so Mm -hmm. ultimately a lot of the time lately i find really good tv shows i end up liking even more than a lot of films except for like the really exceptional films because they're 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 they only have so much time so sometimes even if you have a good director writer maybe that film needed like another hour or another half hour but they don't have time so things get cut and there are some things that feel like uh, things happen and they're not earned or you know mm-hmm. that's why I still love a great movie but I feel like unfortunately there's a lot of mediocrity that comes out too and I suppose you could say that with TV shows as well but even with the mediocre TV shows sometimes they have really great characters where the show's not great but you still get to be with the characters longer and get more into them so you know like Lucifer is one of those shows that I don't necessarily think is a great show but the characters are really fun and the actors who play yeah. them are great so like I've kept watching even though I kind of don't really think the writing for the the show is always great, but I like the characters and I don't, I won't typically do that with a movie. Like typically with a movie, if I'm halfway through and I'm really not enjoying it, I'm, I'm, you know, like I'm kind of just, I'll, I'll finish this later. And then, <laughs> and it used to be the opposite. So, um, and then with games, it's more games. I like, um, I like story and everything, but a majority of the time with games, I like PVP. Like I I'm competitive. Yeah. I like halo. I like, uh, I like split gate. I'm, you know, I'm waiting for the new halo. I, you know, I like a Dota 2 I played for a long time. So I like I like beating people. I like getting really good and being one of the best. Like, that's what I like doing. And when mm-hmm. it comes to a story, like New World or something, essentially what I like is um, I like a good idea that I get to make personal interaction interactive decisions with, which you can't get with films or games. You can only get that yeah. from games. So I like them all, but I, I, I each one, I, I want something different out of it, if that makes sense. So, yeah, very nice. Shout out to the last of the show coming in. <laughs> well, yeah right <laughs> exactly okay so for mine technically these are two questions but I, I you know for time like i don't want this to be like a three-hour podcast I'm, i know you know but at the same time so i'm going to kind of ask them both as one because they work that way okay all right so first question for you is what is your favorite thing about the film industry and then your second question is what is something you dislike about the film industry <laughs> nice i'm gonna start with the negative and end on the positive Okay, that's um, probably a good thing psychologically to do. <laughs> yeah, the the film industry is the most commercialized uh, form of art that we we experience. It's always been kind of the the working man's art piece. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of people couldn't afford to go to a museum and experience you know fine art pieces in that way. It's always been people wrapping up their work day and going out on a date and finding a piece of entertainment. Mm-hmm. So because of the affordability of experiencing film, it's been the most commercialized over time. Yeah. And I think that's led to a, a counterpoint to what will be my, my, one of the things that I love about the film industry. It's, it's stifled a lot of artists. And I think a lot of people have really built up their dreams to be able to tell a story that's important to them. And unfortunately seen it bastardized to, to sell more to the market. You know what yeah. I mean? And I feel I completely agree. Yeah, that happens. It, that, that's also in common with the music industry. They experience that to a degree as well. But when it comes to 
um, other visual arts like uh, painting or drawing that doesn't tend to happen as much. Mm -hmm. Um, But one of my favorite things about the film industry is people being able to share their experiences in such an intimate way to, to the world. Essentially Uh, films are so produced across everywhere that if somebody has a story that so many people relate to, and it really means a lot to them, then they just got, a huge spectrum of eyes and ears to be able to relate to that experience with, you know, however they want to tell it. And that's one of my favorite things. There are so many movies that come out and it tends to be that those, those ones tend to be like a director's first film that like breakthrough. This is the story that they've been dying to tell, you know what I mean? And then you see it and you're like, Oh my God, you know, I I relate to this or I don't relate to that. Or that was so beautiful. You start to really have that human connection with somebody you've never had a conversation with. And that's for sure. My favorite part. Nice. Yeah. And and I almost feel like nowadays, if you want your stuff to be less bastardized and less, you know, kind of essentially screwed with by the studios and stuff, you almost want, it's almost like if you're that kind of director that really wants control and wants to make something good, that's bold, you almost need to try to get your funding from like independent film companies, like maybe like have a 24 or, or, or do like a, a piece milling, um, uh, fundraising event through private donors and then get a distributor like a24 or somebody like that to you know help you with it it almost seems like that's the path you want to go or maybe networks netflix maybe turned into a miniseries or something like if if you want more control it seems like those are the options and that's one thing i yeah. like about the new streaming streaming services because they're actually giving a lot of people control on how to tell their stories which is which is kind of wonderful so I, like we i feel like netflix about... and hulu and these places are kind of destroying the film industry in a lot of ways because it's like why would i go to hollywood where this the studio is going to basically take my script and turn it into an algorithm and make me cut out all the stuff that matters because it sells the most tickets when i can go to network netflix and just do it the way i want like you know and it guarantees yeah. millions and millions of people see it you know so exactly you know, i i just like, finished two shows back to back which i don't remember the last time i finished two shows back to back but i watched midnight <laughs> mass was immediately in love and then i just watched squid game and uh, i just started that i'm halfway through the first episode yeah i also really enjoyed that but i was sitting there and you know we we've been discussing and watching and keeping up with uh south korean film for a very long time and i texted yeah. you the other day i was like what kind of secret social media marketing campaign did netflix put out to make this explode in such a way because i haven't seen korean cinema blow up like this um before parasite parasite was the first one that hit this level of success in the american market and, you know and as I far mean? as i know they didn't they literally just had a trailer i think the trailer i saw the trailer i think the trailer kind of sells itself it really does it's a really interesting trailer you're just like i remember i saw that before it blew up and when i saw the trailer i mean when it hit netflix that day and i and yeah it was just one of those that popped up as a new thing and i saw the trailer and i immediately added it to my thing i was like hmm, i'm gonna watch that one <laughs> like it yeah. just looks good yeah. like i i think it's really exciting and uh, shout out to netflix for finding it and i'm so happy yeah. that it's successful um and i hope and, and it's a netflix show i think so i think they gave netflix them the show. money to produce it so well done like yeah they sure did and it's completely uh korean created with korean actors and it's all subtitled it's all complete yep. creative control to to the creator so why they make, would they go anywhere else yeah and koreans make such great like they make such great cinema whether it's movies i had this is my first korean tv show actually i've seen a ton of korean movies but mm-hmm. also even their music videos i actually do like bts <laughs> but i love yeah. the videos like what got me into bts was the videos i mean these videos look like you know 50 million dollar (laughs) videos you know they look like they spent a grip on them they really care about sets and color and makeup and you know like it's like they do they put they're all into every artistic endeavor that they do that involves film from what i'm seeing like and and music like like they really really do and i i appreciate that because i feel like in the u.s we have some great ones but we also feel like a lot of a lot of them just feel like corporate mediocrity and then here it seems like every director whether you like it or not it it feels like they're putting their heart and soul into everything you know like yeah. almost every korean film i grab they almost never look bad <laughs> they almost you know what i mean like if you like it yeah. that's up to you but they really feel like they're really trying all the time it's really great like and i'm i'm a fan of that so totally um when ooh, i have a couple of good ones back to back i'll start okay with this one. sure you know, when when you find that success as a writer and director, what sort of trademarks do you expect to have or what do you want to be known for? You're just assuming I'm going to. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Uh, well, one thing I feel like I don't want to say, like, 
I'm kind of jealous because uh, I do feel like he kind of beat me to it. Because something I loved as a as, when I was younger, um, I always loved writing, but I didn't know much about filmmaking. I just knew I liked to watch films. But I got mm -hmm. into video editing when I played Halo 2 competitively um, mm -hmm. because I started liking to make montages. And I loved yeah. the beautiful editing of the song choice and like actually syncing stuff to beats and stuff really well. So I always said that when I did, if I got the money to make features, it didn't matter what genre was, there would be a lot of syncing and things in ways that people wouldn't expect, whether it was with scores or sound effects or or perhaps the pacing of the the scene. I wanted to do a lot to like connect the audience to the score or to the moment or you know different things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And I was so jealous, but also super just in love because I loved of Edgar Wright and when he did Baby Driver like the yeah. opening scene of that film I literally was like oh my god he's doing it and then it just happened and then it happened so much throughout the film like till this day I love that film like I, I, I'm like I'm like jealous because he did it first, but I'm also like, I love Edgar White. So I'm like, of course you did. Cause you're brilliant. You know, like, and I'm just like, I was I, like, I've even had ideas with horror um, that I've wanted to do. And there, like, like there are things like, like there are things that I love about some directors, like the way, like, cause, cause sometimes a shot will be gorgeous, but even though it's gorgeous, it kind of takes away from the point of the scene. So it's, right. it's cool. Like, like, I, but th there are things like, for instance, I thought the happening was a bad movie, but there mm -hmm. is a scene in that movie till this day that I love. I loved um, the scene with the gun where yeah. he doesn't follow the face. He like, like essentially each person shooting themselves with the same gun and it follows the gun, not the person. Like mm -hmm. you see one person get out of their car, pick up the gun you hear a gunshot, the body falls. It follows the next person who gets out of the car, picks up the gun. Like, like stuff like that is really interesting. And almost not only is it a clever, but it's actually really creepy because yeah. you're, you're knowing what's happening. And, and every time it lands, you know, there's going to be another victim. You know, there's something about that. That's really interesting. It's the same thing I love about James Wan. So mm -hmm. I feel like with me, I'm heavily inspired by a lot of things. So hopefully if I ever do make it, um, I want to be a director that's known as having a lot of style, but not the kind that hopefully takes away from the film. I want to find interesting ways to shoot and deliver things that, that um, especially accompanied with music and syncing and stuff that like benefits the movie. So I like, you know, I'd love it if it's like, you know, Edward R Edgar Wright or Tarantino where you're like, this movie feels like a fortune movie. You know, I, I want right. that, but I don't want it to feel like a fortune movie just as a joke. I want it to feel like a fortune movie as a great film. Cause like, I tend to like thrillers and stuff. So I probably will be a little bit more serious with most of my films. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah. And then another thing is when it comes to writing, I love to tackle taboo subjects. I love to talk about things that maybe make people uncomfortable because I feel like this whole notion we have of that's uncomfortable. So that's just off the table. Well, if you don't talk about it, then it's going to stay that way. Right. Like mm -hmm. you need to have conversations that make you uncomfortable. Even if it doesn't lead anywhere, the attempt is good. You know what I right. mean? Because it helps us understand things that maybe we don't like, or maybe we're afraid of, or maybe we're disgusted by, or maybe we just don't understand or whatever. Like I like to take weird, interesting subjects or subjects that I think are cool, but are taboo that shouldn't be or, or whatever. Like, and, and I like to find a way to talk about it. And I love philosophy. So a lot of times I'm working out ideas and sometimes it doesn't mean I'm taking the point of view of the person I'm writing about, but mm -hmm. I'm creating their points of view and having them debate or I'm having yeah. them argue. Even if I, maybe I agree with one, maybe I don't agree with either of them, but it's interesting to explore the idea from these two ideological viewpoints, which is another reason why I loved Midnight Mass, because essentially yeah. it's tackling a supernatural scenario through mm -hmm. essentially three different perspectives, a psychological, a philosophical, and a religious perspective. Yeah. Um, and, and essentially that, that's kind of what my YouTube video is, is about right now. It's essentially about the dangers of ideologues going too far and the counterbalance to that is the film also has two characters that are pragmatists for the most part so uh -huh. and, and it's about and it's about that that um counterplay um and and the ending of the, of the of the show to me is very it's very obvious what the writer director is saying and i think it's a beautiful thing because if you really think about it um even religious people you know there, there's a notion there where he's not the religion uh, so guys, just, you know, if you haven't seen Midnight Mass, spoiler, cut like 20 seconds ahead of this, okay, as of right now. But for like the religious people, 
the religion didn't really destroy the island. You know, it mm-hmm. was the way people decided to interpret it and do what they wanted with it, which is what an ideologue does because they see everything through it. That's what destroyed the islands, really. Regardless right. of what people, each person believed, ultimately that destroyed everything. Um, uh-huh. So, and, and it's very obvious what the message is. It's about mm-hmm. like not being too embedded in your beliefs that it overshadows everyone else. You know, th- th- at least right. that's one that's one subtextual theme throughout the show. Um, mm-hmm. So I love stuff like that. That's why like things like that speak personally to me because you said something wonderful through a really awesome story. You know, like yeah. and I like that. It's another reason I like the Matrix trilogy. So. I also uh, discovered my personal kryptonite is actually just a conversation between Riley and Joe Collin. <laughs> i know no literally like and, and i was telling you uh that final scene with her uh yeah. where she's going through that scene i was so happy because essentially i told you i spent years studying pretty much every religion that exists and even some that are extinct wanting in mm-hmm. my opinion at that when i was younger trying to figure out which one i thought was true right and ultimately yeah. the what i came to was essentially exactly what she said that's why i was like oh my god i feel like this movie's just for me and i feel like now i want to meet mike flanagan more than ever because we're like I feel like the exact same way. And that was beautifully put into words. So I'm like, I just, I loved it. Like at the end, I was just like, I'm just in heaven. I love this movie. Yeah. And I love the people who wrote this movie. Like I, you and I are like this, like we're, we're, we're cool. <laughs> like there's more people like me. I feel less alone. You know, <laughs> like yeah. it was great. So exactly. I liked it. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> great question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, got, let me talk about that a little bit early. <laughs> the video I'm working on. <laughs> okay, so here's one. Uh, might be a struggle. What are your top three video games? Favorite games. And they don't have to be the ones that you think are critically famous, just your three favorite. <laughs> okay, can I do series? Sure. I can break it down by series. I don't know if I can break it down <laughs> by game in a reasonable uh, time. Fine, let's go. Right. Series is fine. Number one, the Capcom versus series. For those who don't know, because we haven't talked about it much on here, I'm a huge fighting game nerd. I've been playing a long he's, time. He's a sponsored fighting game nerd, so he's actually a pro fighting game player. Don't let him be all humble. Okay. Well, the Marvel vs. Capcom series, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's my favorite from a, from a gameplay perspective and just seeing those, that every, every release feels special. Um, okay. As far as story and gameplay, I would say uh, the the Souls Born Sekiro <laughs> series has kind of <laughs> wiggled its way into my heart over the years. Um, Souls like exce- game, Souls like game. So uh, Dark okay. Souls one through three, Bloodborne, Sekiro, um, kind of having story take a backseat to creating your own story in a lot of ways through just experiencing the environment and also the sense of accomplishment you get from figuring out something that's very difficult really uh really hits me that might be i i think i enjoy that series in a lot of reasons for the same way i enjoy fighting games because you're not i mean you are leveling up a character but more so you're you're working towards a goal not by making your character stronger in a lot of ways but it's by making yourself better and I, yeah, I think I share sure. that uh, that love with fighting games and, and the Souls here. I also um, like the Dark Souls series. It's one of my faves as well. I, I actually own Bloodborne and Sekiro, but I haven't played them much yet. I need to play them. So. Uh, Bloodborne is just... <sighs> yes, uh, I've heard. I've case. heard. <laughs> All my friends love it. <laughs> um, my last favorite series would probably be... It would probably be... Huh. It's a tough one. I know. Uh, I want to lean into the Legend of Zelda series, but I haven't played all of them. But they have a sense of wonder that I love. Okay. But if I had to say something that felt a little more true, it might be. Hmm. I know. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just messing for, with... <laughs> uh, for the amount of times I've beaten it, I haven't beaten any games as many times as I've beaten uh, The Last of Us games. Uh, the yeah, first so... second, I've, I've beaten them multiple times. I've, I've fallen in love with the characters, and I didn't That's know great. stories could be told that way within video games until that first Last of Us game. It's like playing a great movie. 
it is like playing a great movie. And even though the gameplay isn't the best, uh, I've never seen characters developed that way in a video game before. So yeah, the I first know... one's still one of my faves. So yeah, I know there's still haven't a... finished the second one yet whole lot of nonsense and controversy around the second one but i, I loved it the same so i know they're completely different but i would have to say uh, legend of zelda or, or last of us for, for part three okay no that's fair good answers and uh, so far i'm loving the second one i just haven't finished it yet like i, I keep saying i'm gonna get back to it but then all these new games keep... and now i have new world out i'm waiting for halo in december and back for bloods coming out tomorrow so i'm just like Ugh! Like, oh like i just I, uh, I got <laughs> yeah. this... i've been playing back for Bloods for a couple days it's blast. yeah yeah i'm just like i'm Ugh. Like I'm so and I have to split my time between it. even oh I played the beta, I loved it. Like but yeah. even New World the Back for Blood, I'm like, I don't want to stop playing New World, but I want to play Back for Blood. It's just too many. No. Uh okay. Good uh question. your turn. Thank you. Um I'm gonna go with what doomed project do you wish would have happened the most? Doomed project? Oh, okay. Um what what got stuck in uh, production hell or was supposed to happen and that got canceled? Something that you were really excited for. I would have loved. I would have. I would have loved to. I love Guillermo del Toro, mm-hmm. and I would have loved to see his version of the Hobbit trilogy because he oh, was a, he was yeah. originally he was originally going to do that and i don't know if it was a scheduling conflict or an issue with the theater i have no the, the the studio i'm not sure but he had to he backed out or whatever happened and then uh from what i read peter jackson took over it and didn't have any intention of taking over it. he was just executive producing it and he kind of got left with this huge job that he probably did not want to do so i, I applaud <laughs> him for doing it but because i love guillermo del toro and his style and I do love the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I would have really loved to have seen what Guillermo del Toro, what it would have looked at if, like, if Guillermo del Toro had been responsible for all three of those films. But, so th- there's a few projects, but that's the first one that jumps to mind right now. So I'm going to go with that one. I love that you said that because my number one would be Guillermo del Toro's at the Mountain of Madness. I think Lovecraft <laughs> is the most like <laughs> yeah. poorly or underexplored kind of creative force that could be fantastic in movies. And Guillermo del Toro, his I style matches what I imagine a lot of those stories feel and look like. Yeah, it, I feel like Guillermo del Toro is probably the most snubbed director. Me too. Like till <laughs> this day, Pan, Pan's Project. Labyrinth is one of my favorite films of all time. It's probably oh, my yeah. top ten list. Um, yeah, uh, I still need to see some of his older films. Actually, I still haven't seen The Devil's Backbone. And I haven't seen uh, what was Kronos? the vampire Chronos. I haven't seen Chronos yeah. either. Um, it's fantastic. They're I've heard good. great things. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I love Guillermo del Toro. Even if the movie isn't as good, it always looks beautiful, and it has a really beautiful. Like I feel like you you kind of feel his style to some extent. Like you just and he has a really unique color grade he likes to use too that I think is beautiful, and I don't think anyone else uses it. So a lot of blues really, and greens and golds. Yeah, greens and golds, but there's almost like a greenish pinkness to 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 people. That's weird, but it looks it makes it look good. Like I don't know how to describe it. It's really cool. Yeah, it's it's yeah. cool that you said Guillermo del Toro because I could have thought I would have thought you would have said uh, Corey Fukunaga's It because I thought that was gonna be your answer. <laughs> you know what's funny? I think because <laughs> it was one that know, I wanted to see, but like yeah, uh, I can't remember the the director who did it. I know he did Mama, but the first It felt like he captured what the story felt like for the first half. So I mean, I feel like Corey Fukunaga would have brought that darkness in that it would have been less fun than the movie see, ended up being and see that's kind of what i wanted like i thought the yeah. first one was well directed but i felt like it was eerie it was never really scary and, and that's and i wanted to feel terror when i'm watching it so that's kind of that's probably why i would have preferred to see what carrie did but that's yeah. just me and for me the the book is so good that i feel like even though i was really excited for that project like they got the kids right and that's so yeah the, the kids were great the book, the for sure. of the book the is the way the kids interact and what they have to go yeah. with. and they got pennywise right um they, outside oh, no, of no, some they could have gone more messed up with it, but yeah, Scarsgar was great. Scarsgar was great as as Pennywise, one hundred percent. Their, their so, casting was top notch for sure. Yeah. So even though like there's clearly a better movie there, like I've read the book, I've I've experienced the story. I'm not too upset that he didn't get it. <laughs> yeah. And then he went on to James Bond. So good for him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so so I'm gonna start speeding this up just a little bit so yep. that uh, um, so I'm gonna you guys want to you want to start like asking two questions at a time. Cool. Is that cool? Yep. Uh, okay, so here are some of yours. <laughs> so here's two for you. Um, what order should I watch this in? 
Okay, I think I'm going to reverse these. Would you ever be interested in writing or directing a film project? And who are some of your favorite screenwriters? Okay. Uh, I'm going to give a couple of my favorite screenwriters first. I mean, the first is a yes. I would love to write and direct a film project. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I wish I would dedicate more time to it because I've, I've spread myself into so many things. But writing and directing, I absolutely love it. And I'm one of those people, like many others, who starts a project, gets scared, and doesn't finish it. Um, <laughs> hey, we've so, all done stuff like that. So Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would love to do that. Um, so short answer, yes. Um, a few let's, of my start, favorite... let's start with some short films. We'll do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, favorite screenwriters right now. Um, Mike Flanagan. Wait, I've mm-hmm. been nerding out about him for years. After Midnight um, Mass, I, I, yeah, that one, that one for sure. What, uh, what he understands more than a lot of other directors in horror is horror is an extension of tragedy. And whether it be Hill yeah. House or Blythe Manor, um, his films, Hush, his adaption of Dr. Sleep, Gerald's Game, he understands that like ghosts and monsters, he makes them visual representation of pain. You know what I mean? And I think he does it better than better than anyone else. Yeah. Um, Midnight Mass also, had a very Stephen King-esque feel to it as well. Midnight Mass is the most Stephen King thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> except, except, like I said, really good ending. Because sometimes Stephen King has good endings and sometimes they're okay. So... Yeah, but even after Doctor Sleep, like it was like, oh, you know, uh, I a fun episode might be a uh, or a fun topic for one day might be um, directors who understand their writer, understand their author. You know what I mean? And I yeah, feel like that, that, that Lincoln, would probably he be a gets good what one. Stephen King wants to do. You know what I mean? Yeah. I really appreciate that. I can uh, see that. Uh, and another one would be uh, Martin McDonough. Who did yeah, uh, three billboards outside of Ebbing, Missouri? And Bruges is one of my favorite movies. Seven Psychopaths. Seven Psychopaths. Yeah, he's in I love, a, I love those. Yeah, yeah, he's in that like Tarantino esque genre where everything's really snappy and kind of like surprise mm-hmm. violence and all that. He definitely has that about him, but I think he is one of the uh, kind of people who came after Tarantino that developed that into something unique. You know what I mean? I agree. I agree. Yeah. I also think he's one of those people that can make me like suddenly laugh at things that I wouldn't expect to laugh exactly. at. Exactly. Which, which I really appreciate because I most like American style comedies, I don't find that funny. It's just a bunch of people that they basically have improving all over the place most of the time. And, and most of the stuff isn't that funny to me. I'm glad if you like it, but it's just not my thing. But he yeah. makes me laugh quite a bit. That's another reason why I l- recommended Fleabag to you. That was the first time I was just laughing out loud for like the entire, I loved Fleabag so much. It was so funny. And I'm actually like two episodes into the second season now. I'm so happy. <laughs> like yeah. so good. <laughs> um, and then uh, one little cherry on top who sure. uh, would probably be David Simon, the creator of The Wire. Um, I've oh, never yeah. seen anything like that again since uh, since that project. I think I've never seen a, a city and the people in it explored so thoroughly, realistically, yeah. and painfully. What did he do after The Wire? Did he do anything else? He's done a couple of HBO shows. His most recent one was called The Deuce. Uh, oh, I was, heard about that one. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And uh, right now he is working on, he's going back to Baltimore where The Wire takes place. And he is, uh, it's starring John Bernthal. I can't recall the title, but it has to do oh. with uh, the police force during a certain decade. So I'm sure it'll be, I'm sure it'll be great. Nice. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah just, uh, I like John Bernthal. I know, so. The reason uh, I know about it is he uh, just paused the project to pull filming out of Texas due to the laws mm-hmm. that are going on right now. So they're looking gotcha. for a new state to film it. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Good to know. Nice. All right. I got two for you. Sure. And I know that I've asked you two a couple times. So if you want to do like two or three next time, I get you. Just do your thing. <sighs> okay. I got you. <laughs> um, I'm looking for two really quick that uh, feel like they can go together. Uh, of course, my first one. What genre do you think has the most unmapped potential? And. Whose work are you most excited about right now? Ooh, okay. So I think the genre that has the most un... Ooh, I kind of feel like it's tied, really. I kind of feel like, for me, it's it's sci-fi, fantasy, and I would say sci-fi and fantasy... Um. 
and horror really but i just feel like with horror we have seen a lot already i'm sure there's gonna always be more but sci-fi just because of the nature of it like you can really go with anything like and and because i think with horror you're inventing something within a world uh you can mix it up by making it in the future or something but with sci-fi and fantasy by nature they cover something that doesn't exist yet so Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like with sci-fi, typically it's a science fiction. It's something that doesn't exist, which gives you a complete bank blank canvas versus a lot of horror films. They might be set in modern times. So you have certain you have certain um, fixed variables that you can still find interesting ways to alter. But with sci-fi and fantasy, literally fantasy is a completely invented world. And then sci-fi, yeah. the future has not occurred yet. So a lot of sci-fis happen in made up modern futures made up modern past or made up modern you know presence but that means you're essentially making it all up so both sci-fi and fantasy give you such latitude to do anything you want that i feel like we probably haven't even begun to um, i mean i know you could say this about any genre but i think those ones even more so really really um envelop that idea so i would go with sci-fi and fantasy uh Very for that nice. question and then what directors you said what directors am i excited about right uh, now is that what you said no i just said it doesn't have to be a director whose work are you most excited about right now okay um could be a writer actor director game um, creator maybe musician mm-hmm. okay um give me a second so one would be greg hurwitz who writes the orphan x book series um, I really, really love them. It's it's almost like a, it's almost like kind of a Jason Bourne kind of thing, but he has a really interesting spin on it with who Orphan X is, and honestly, his father figure, who is kind of like his contact, reminds me a lot of like like I rem- imagine kind of like Sully from uh, Uncharted, which I can't yes. help it. Like, uh, but um, and, he, and it has this really interesting pay it forward uh, type of element to it that is very very unique and it makes that character evan smoke really really interesting in that genre of of uh, spy or former spry you know kind of thriller uh even though he's exceptionally dangerous and i've listened to all of them on audible and the same voice actor does all of them and he's so great as evan smoke that i feel like whoever they get to play him in a tv show or movie i will always be like they don't sound right (laughs) like i just <laughs> I can't help it, but like, so yeah, Greg Hurwitz. I love the Orphan, Orphan X series. I just finished the most recent book, Prodigal Son. There are five or six books, and I pretty much buy them instantly when they show up on Audible. So that's a big one. Um, for film, um, I would say that um, if, there are a few projects. I'm especially – my next big one that I'm especially waiting for is uh, – Lana Wachowski's The Matrix Resurrections. Like, I really, really want to see what she does with that, and I want to see what um, what the subject matter is, if it's something new and interesting. And if it is a rehash, knowing her, it's going to seem like a rehash until something happens. Like, so I'm kind of interested to see what happens with that story. Uh, yeah. So those are, those are big ones for me right now. I was really interested to see Midnight Mass uh, just because um, – I what I like. shut up about it. Yeah, you couldn't <laughs> shut up about it. A few people, other people let me know. And it's one of those things that went under the radar for me. I didn't even know Mike Flanagan was working on another project. And I love that I didn't even watch the trailer. So everything mm-hmm. was a surprise. Yeah. Um, so Mike Flanagan, that's got me really excited um, about his whatever his next project is, which he's currently already working on. And it's called Midnight Something Else. So I'm wondering if it's going to be like a midnight trilogy of different anthology stories that have the word midnight in them or take a place around midnight. I'm not sure. Dun, dun, dun. Um, right yeah and then and then i'm also um there's a lot of projects i'm interested in, but because it's dear to my heart i'm very interested to see how the new scream is i want to see what they do with it it's going to have to be the first one that probably has a very different feel i'm hoping they capture the essence of west face vision i mean west west face west craven and ghost face i just combined them but west craven's vision mm-hmm. while still having an interesting idea and i hope they do justice to the original characters um so there's probably a lot more, but off the top of my head, those are those are the ones I would go with right now. Nice. And tell you what, I know uh, that we're we're coming up on time. Instead of doing two questions a piece and speeding through, let's do. You want to do two or three more rounds, and we could just pick our best. Okay, that works for me. That works. You want to do that? It can yeah. be multiple question if you want. I'm 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 fine with that. Okay, cool. What do you think we should do? Two or three? Let's do at least three. If we're not going to do 20 questions, so. Sweet. Uh, at least three we, more would be, what, 15, 12? I think that'd be like 12 to 15. I'll tell you what, we can thoroughly answer some questions. 
<laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, I know. Like, like we're very long winded in our answers, guys. I'm sorry. Like, so no, that's uh, as we should. Be. I mean, we can have a longer one. I mean, I don't mind. I'm just, I just want to make sure I'm respectful to everybody else too. So it's your call. Cool. You go ahead, though. Then let's do let's do four more. That should okay. put us just four more shy of the two hour mark. Okay, four more okay. sounds good. All right, let's do four more. Uh, was I up or were you up? You were up. But no, no, I'm up, I guess, because you, right. you just asked me. So are yep. we doing just one question for the four? Uh, unless you have two that go together. Okay. Just, uh, we'll call it four more rounds each. Okay. Okay, here's one. Uh, what are some changes that you think the film industry will go through over the next decade? Yeah, I think um, the, the film industry right now are what seems like we're kind of after the Me Too movement and kind of the reckoning that Hollywood has gone through, and I hope in a way that it continues to go through kind of a, a level of accountability to what the culture has been for so long, and I think we'll see that trend continue. Um, I also think what we're going to experience a lot more of is unique and diverse voices within the film industry. I think we're going to continue to get a lot of stories and experiences that haven't been thoroughly explored uh, within a lot of projects. And I'm very excited about that. Um, I think that we are going to, this last 10 years, um, 2010 through 2020 was an incredibly commercialized decade um, yeah, yeah, within the really film was. industry. It's been very, um, it's been very uh, kind of marketable um, and, and mass produced. I think, uh, every 10 years that tends to kind of shift within a paradigm. Um, yeah, it does. So I think we're going to have it swing for another decade towards a lot more independent projects alongside those big commercial releases, I um, so. which I'm really excited about. Um, and that will also go along with uh, new voices within the film industry kind of making their own projects. So I think those things go, go hand in hand. Nice. Um, I also think we are about to get a lot of post pandemic experiences. I think uh, this, yeah, me too. Yeah, this me too. this kind of moment of loneliness and seclusion is going to lead artists to uh, a new creative space, and I'm I'm excited to see them share their experiences. We've already seen a few of them. My favorite being probably Bo Burnham's Inside. I thought was really good. I really like that. Yeah, yeah um, Malcolm and Marie was really good. That that wasn't really a post pandemic film though. That was just shot during the pandemic. I so really I'm enjoyed ex- that film too. I, I, yeah. I thought their performances were great too. Me too. But I'm excited now that we've kind of gone through this as a culture and kind of as a world. I'm I'm excited to see the way artists express themselves around it. So yeah, okay. Um, continued accountability and culture change in Hollywood. Uh, more diverse and individual um, projects. Okay. and uh post pandemic uh emotional work i think are the three big things we're really gonna see okay okay yeah. okay so here's one for you <laughs> i'm gonna combine two questions because they kind of might go hand in hand or be similar or they might end up being the same answer i'm not sure so we'll hold those for a moment good sir because it's my turn to ask you a question oh that's right i'm so <laughs> sorry i'm so sorry <laughs> no it's okay they're wrapped up <laughs> <laughs> so sorry you. I'm a greedy um, bitch, apparently. I'm <laughs> you greedy bitch. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I know how uh, special Buffy the Vampire is for you um, and how it's one of your favorite just creative projects that you've seen. The, the series, yeah. The series, yeah. What work have you seen that has captured parts of that magic and how so? And like repackaged it, you mean? Like, like what, what work do I what, like? What work do I think is inspired by Buffy? Since then? yeah, I just kind of want to. I, I, oh, what uh, I'm trying to do is uh, understand your love for it a little bit more. So, what else have you seen where you've watched it and you're like, "Ooh, this is just like Buffy in this specific way," and that's why I love this movie. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. so so like other shows that I love that have some of the same character or some of the same things that I love about Buffy that I found in other shows, essentially. Right. Oh, that's a good question. Ooh, that's a tough one, actually, because I feel like even a lot of shows that I love, it's hard to always find that. Um, mm-hmm. Could be a uh, movie, too. Yeah. Um, 
Ooh, <laughs> that's that's really hard. Um, okay, give me a second here. I so, will. in terms of what I love about Buffy, how about you ask me another one while I think about that one? Because <laughs> I need I time. You. All right. How about? Because I feel like one of my answers is a cheat. I was gonna say Angel, but that's a spin-off, so it's like. Ah, no. uh, yeah, you know, that'd be like if you asked me that about Breaking Bad, I was like, "Well, better call Saul." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's why I'm like, that's why I'm like, that's not gonna work. <laughs> um, I'll ask you one kind of uh, on things you don't love. Is there a current trope or trend in storytelling that you're seeing a lot of right now that you would just quit already? superhero movies <laughs> i'm just <laughs> sick of them i'm just sick of them i'm just like and the thing is i like superhero movies but when we're so inundated with them and like 60 to 70 percent of all the big ips regardless of whether it's dc or marvel or whatever and then mm. a lot of the tv shows now are superhero themed it's just so much that i'm just i'm kind of burnt out on superheroes like i just am i don't hate them at all it's just like for instance dim sum is one of my favorite foods if i had to eat it every day i would get so sick of it it's basically (laughs) that like it's i'm sick of superhero movies Uh, and i'm sick of people going oh we're gonna do something different with superhero movies you know but it's still a freaking superhero like i'm just can you stop like just can you i don't know and i understand it makes a lot of money so they won't but it's just it's weird like being from an era where there were all these big budget movies but they felt more unique or they were based on a book Mm -hmm. or they felt original and now everyone's connected to every other one and they're all superhero movies basically like it's just it's just a bit much for me like and and i was always very excited about superhero movies finally getting made i'm just sick of it it's just so much you know what i mean so i I thought the uh the grand finale was logan (laughs) like no that felt like that uh, that, it's so good i know that felt like the deconstruction one you know what I yeah. mean? And I yeah. was like, okay, so now we're in the deconstructionalist superhero movies, which have been done before, but not in like a mass marketed way. And then it yeah. made like a billion dollars. And then the Joker did too. <laughs> I was like, oh, we're locked in. We're doing this for a while. Um, so to your first question, I would say a few different projects for for theme and like intense versions of philosophy, which is mm-hmm. heavy throughout Buffy, I would say in some ways, but in a less of an emotional way, because the characters are great, but I don't love them as much. The Matrix was very much... Mm-hmm. Buffy's very philosophy-based, and it's a huge thing. So, like, that element I kind of got from The Matrix. And also Midnight Mass, in a way, from philosophy yeah. and stuff. So those hit me there. But as far as characters, just loving being with the characters, and I could be them with them anytime. Completely different genre of show, Third Rock from the Sun. Like, nice. Third Rock from the Sun yeah. is one of those shows where you could put on any time, and I'm so happy to be with Dick and Mary and Tommy and Harry and Sally and Nina. And, like, like, like I, I, I am there. I, I think it's kind of similar to how, you, how most people feel about, like, friends, right? You love right. those people. Like, they, they do something for you. So, to me, the, what I love about Buffy is the people are very unique in a Whedon-esque way. Only Joss Whedon can write them that way. Um, um, and, and it's that combined with, you know all the demons and monsters are metaphorical versions of things you have to face to grow up. Essentially Buffy is about growing up. Um, So all the demons and monsters represent something. And, and a lot of the times throughout the show, if you pay close attention to what's happening in the episode around that demon or around this big bad boss for the season, Buffy is learning something about being an adult in every single one of them. And every character is an extension of Buffy. Like, you know, like Mm. Xander's her heart. He, he, you know, so every character, and this is all true. It's been proven. Mm -hmm. Like, like, um, so every single character, even if they're going through something, technically whatever they're going through is actually about Buffy. If you really pay attention. And that's, what's interesting about Buffy and Angel because Angel in actuality, a lot's about Angel, but those characters actually do have episodes that are just about those characters, and it's a more mm-hmm. of a gray area show. Essentially, Buffy is about growing up, and uh, another YouTuber I love, uh, Passion of the Nerd, so call out. If you haven't heard of Passion of the Nerd, if you're a huge Boss Whedon fan, I totally recommend him. I love him. But he uh, pointed out something very well that I agree with, and it's that Buffy is essentially philosophic about growing up while Angel is about being an adult. Um, mm-hmm. And Angel's vampirism is constantly dealt with um, under the guise of an alcoholic who's trying not to drink is essentially, and the writers even admitted that he's an alcoholic who's trying not to binge because he has a history of binging. Um, and he's the worst vampire of all time. So he's trying so hard to make up for his wrongs. 
and he's an alcoholic mm -hmm. that's constantly dealing with his problems in his past. So, so those are themes that are uh, going on. But yeah, but the characters in Buffy are so unique. Once you get used to them by the end of this, first season's a little rough, but after that, like once you get through it in season two, you'll never meet, and that's why it's hard because that's the thing, you'll never meet any of the other characters like them in Buffy. That's why it's really hard for me to answer that question because Buffy yeah. is so uniquely good in those ways that that's why it's my favorite show i i still have never seen anything actually like it <laughs> so yeah. i see pieces of things there's pieces of buffy and supernatural there's pieces of buffy and the vampire diaries but like it's just taking things from it more than being the same kind of ensemble if that makes sense like buffy just did yeah. everything first for the most part so it's just nice good i love it awesome. and i still watch it like once a year <laughs> pretty much <laughs> <laughs> very good good answer sir Okay, uh, so here are the two that I was going to combine for you. So, because they might go together, like I said. So, okay. um, what is one of the most unique experiences you have had while watching a film or a series? And then the second question is, what movie or series made you feel the most intense emotions? Okay. And they could be the same thing. That's why I'm like, maybe I'll ask them together. And if they're not, cool. But uh, the first one was most unique experiences. Yeah, while, while, while watching the film or series. All right. Or maybe um, book. You know, how about that? Just any kind of artistic medium. What's the most emotion? Some Like, like, like what, what's the most unique experience uh, you've had yeah. while experiencing uh, a piece of art? Okay. Let's see. The uh, most unique experience I've had while experiencing a piece of art was I think uh, it's a it's a story that I still have a, a memento from uh, it, I'll say unique this wasn't one of the most emotional but it, it was very impactful um, so I used to live uh, in Oakland off MacArthur Boulevard and this was uh, somewhat not very early on but my my, my now fiance girlfriend at the time had just uh we had just moved in together and we lived right next to a uh, a landmark theater called the grand lake theater in oakland oh, wow. and i i cool. heard that it may not be there anymore but i don't know if that's true i haven't checked oh that's out. a but, shame um it was a beautiful theater it didn't look like a movie theater it looked like uh like a stage play theater in fact it had like ottomans and balconies and um you know very <laughs> unique kind of architecture and it was really beautiful um, like and it. I got us tickets because it was one of the stops on the uh, the Hateful Eight's 35 millimeter road show. Oh, that's awesome! So I still have so cool. a booklet that I got from that 35 millimeter road show of different kind of shots of Tarantino directing and large kind of layouts of the characters. And uh, I don't remember if we decided to uh, smoke a joint or have an edible, but we got high before we went and saw it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we we took our seats and uh, we we sat down. And it started with uh, the raising of a the, like a red drape to unveil the movie theater screen, and then the movie theater screen uh, opened to a bright red image of a like a silhouette of a of the horse and carriage that's in the movie. And it started with a, a orchestral intro. Yeah, from from the thing. Mark from Tony's the thing, yeah. exactly. So um, that is still one of my favorite kind of artistic experiences I've seen. And then seeing that movie, which um, seeing it that way, I absolutely <laughs> adored it. Over time, it's not one of my favorites anymore, but that moment still has a yeah. really special place in my heart. Um, nice. it, it was awesome. Very nice. Um, yeah, it's not one of my favorites of his, but I still thought it was fantastic. Like, it's, it's, yeah. like, it's, like, it's like saying, oh, it's, it's amazing, but it's not his best. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> I still, one of the lines that never fails to just make me crack up is the slow motion of Sam Jackson saying, you're gonna trust that dastardly <laughs> bitch. Yeah, like, I know. Like, still kills me. <laughs> so good. Oh. Um, let's see. And then most emotional I've been during a movie. Um, uh, I'd say there, there's happy and sad ones that have really hit me. Um, the sad one, uh, the movie really did its job, um, but what was her name? The mother's story in Requiem for a Dream is one of oh, the harshest yeah. things 
Oh, it is so sad. Like that, that I kills have ever me. seen in my life. Yeah, it um, kills me. It kills me. Like the the loneliness that she experiences and her her addiction to uh, prescription drugs eventually, and her her hallucinations to the TV screen, and her uh, you know her emotional connection with uh, a game show host, and how that kind of becomes her <laughs> world that leads her to a psych yeah. hospital. I have never felt yeah. so heartbroken for a character other than that in any movie. Ever. It's it's definitely one of the worst three for me too. Like in terms yeah. of just just Jesus, like it just it makes you want to just call your mom and say I love you. <laughs> like right. even even if you even if you're mad at her or something for a second, you're just like whatever's going on, I love you. Bye. Like I just yeah. want you to know this. <laughs> like <laughs> exactly. Um, so I'm trying to think of one on the the really positive side. Um, well, that's, not pos- that's not positive. The no, that's one of the after side. somebody. <laughs> That's it's about, it's yeah. about to be one of their negative stories. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, and then on the positive side, um, I think one of the most kind of positive experiences I've had and that brought out like that incredible, like blissful, happy emotion that I've seen in the movie would have to be... That one might take me a little longer to consider. Sure. Um, if you want to think about it, you can ask me something, and I'll I'll answer. Yeah. Let me uh let me meditate on that one. Because I know how that is. That's how I felt with one of yours. <laughs> yeah. Um. Let me ask you. What is your favorite type of setting in a movie, and uh, oh. how do you think it adds to the story? Oh. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, my favorite kind of setting. Okay, there's a few, but like one thing I love, um, I love regardless. It, 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 I feel like it happens more so in like horror or sci-fi, mostly horror. But I love mm-hmm. two things. Uh, I'll say two things, and they they both can lend to horror or sci-fi or whatever. I love the idea of like some kind of ancient evil rising, like like that's really old. That, that's uh-huh. that's right that's rising up um something about that like i've always loved like when i was younger i always loved like archaeology and ancient things and stuff like that so the idea of something old that's uh like one of my favorite lines i don't remember it was actually a line in buffy actually um they're trying to find uh something and uh they can't and and you know they're used to looking through all the ancient books and finding everything and this thing there there's nothing about in any of their records which hasn't really happened before and she Mm -hmm. said maybe it's something else and they said something new and she said no something old something so old that it predates the written word you know like something the ideas of things like that are fascinating to me like something so old that existed before people could write so therefore you know nothing about it which makes it that much more terrifying if it decides to not want you to exist anymore (laughs) You know, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other setting I love, which I'm, I kind of, one of the scripts I'm writing is called The Lodge. And I kind of, I didn't take this idea, but I do a version of it because I love this. So it's kind of perfect question. I love the idea of coming somewhere or waking up one morning or something like that and everybody's gone and you don't know why. Like, for some reason, mm-hmm. I love that stuff. I love the mystery. Like, I remember the Dean Koontz book, Phantoms, which also in the movies, she's coming uh, with uh, her Her sisters played by uh, Rose, um, Rose McGowan, and Ben yeah. Affleck is the, is the chief. But I like the idea that they're driving, and you're getting to know the characters for, like, a good 15 minutes, which is great, because you're getting to know the characters. And when they get, the ta- get to the town, everyone's gone. But I love also the added mystery that everyone's gone, but some cars are still running some things are still baking. So there's this idea that it all happened at once, but that's impossible for everyone to go away at once, right? But that there's no bodies, there's no blood. Like you can add whatever mystery you want to make it more interesting, but the idea that everyone's gone for no reason, like I, for Mm -hmm. something about that I like, like I remember, even though it was kind of a crappy TV movie, I loved, I don't know if it was a Stephen King, but the Langoliers where they land the airport. That is Stephen King. (laughs) Yeah, they they, they land the plane at the airport and they can't figure out why nobody's around. Like like those kind of movies, I love that. I, I love I love that mystery and you could go a thousand directions with it, you know, and do something interesting. But for some reason those are just off the top of my head, those are two things I really like. Um but I've always nice. I'm always kind of like, Oh, I'm in. Like it might even be bad, but I'm kinda in. I wanna find out. <laughs> like you know, yeah. like I like those. Yeah. I like those quite a bit. I like those too. 
Um, did you watch HBO's The Leftovers? No, not yet. And you keep Sir. talking about it. I know you keep talking about it. I, I'm I'm gonna watch it. I promise. That's it's literally my... the entire plot. Really <laughs> One day, like Thanos snapped, and people are having to figure out what happened. <laughs> yeah. Um, so like, it's on my list. That one's been on my list for a while. I just haven't watched it yet. I will though. Yeah. Um. I I fail. I you know I've had more emotional experiences than this. Going back to your last question, but on the on the positive end, my my mind kept going back to characters that go through incredible struggle and are still able to succeed. Mm-hmm. Do you hear those sirens? Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay. I live next to a fire station. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Um. And my my mind goes to Lord of the Rings and the last hour of just cool down after the ring is destroyed and you just sit there like I just watched somebody go through hell for like. <laughs> hours and now you just get to see like you think everything's gonna be okay but it's yeah. not like he did it but he's just completely emotionally yeah. exhausted it takes a toll a whole different like... person and i think that last hour always hits me really heavy um i know there are other films that have hit me more than that but that would be a good example of kind of the opposite end of like success that i, I really like in film I could see that, and I know how yeah. much the Lord of the Rings trilogy means to you. It's one of your favorites, so I could totally see that being like yeah. super, super impactful for you emotionally, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, I know which one I'm asking you next. <laughs> I got one. Who is your favorite character, and why are they your favorite character? From anything? Yeah. Oh, you're so mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's mean. Ask me another one while I think about that, please. <laughs> like, I, I, oh. All and right. I can only pick one? You can pick one. Oh. <laughs> I don't All know right. if I can answer that. Like, <laughs> I'm going I'm to give try. you a question to think about it, and I'm going to throw you a softball. Okay. Uh, where do you fall on the whole debate on digital versus film? Um... I personally don't care. Well, like I understand mm-hmm. why they do, but mm-hmm. I think that's kind of just people trying to protect something that they that they personally love, and 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 that and that's worth trying to protect. Like you know, I mean, yeah, feel free. But I I don't I don't care. Like like I think that I think that both should be allowed to be used. I mean, yep. depending on the project, there are even people who've done stuff in post where it looks almost just like film, but like you can mm-hmm. still rent a digital film. You could, you could, you could, you know, from a studio, you could use a real film one. I say, do what you want. I don't think there should be any verses. I think that there are two different tools used to get different looks and feels and different mediums, just like you use a different kind of lens for a different kind of shot or a different kind of lighting for a different shot. It's a tool, you know? Yeah. And I think that they're both, there's space for both. So I think the argument is stupid. <laughs> I um, agree. It just, it just kind of comes off as like a bunch of big passionate babies. It's like you guys can exist together. Stop fighting. Just you use film, you use digital. That's totally great. <laughs> good for both of you. We'll make a good move. Make a good movie. We'll be happy. Okay. Like, La- <laughs> like laughs and Roger Deakins. Yeah. Um, okay. 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 So this isn't my absolute favorite character, but it is one that I love, and it is more recent. I absolutely love Jack Sparrow. <laughs> ah, that's a good one. Because like he is not my favorite. I would need more time to 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 really think about that. But off the top of my head, someone that I just love, I only see those movies for Jack Sparrow. I couldn't give a damn about anyone else in those movies, even though I like the other actors. Like, Barbados? but if you make a yeah, Bar- oh, Barbados <laughs> is my second favorite. <laughs> yeah, you best start believing in ghost yeah. stories, Miss yeah. Turner. You're in one. Yeah, he's yeah. great. But like Jack Sparrow, his just buffoonery is on a level of just grandness that i have never seen before and the way he is presented that first movie with the music and the fact when you see him on the ship and then it cuts the wide and you realize he's sinking like the way they set him up is just so (laughs) glorious and the fact that the way johnny depp plays him is so glorious and the fact that he's actually kind of brilliant he's just always drunk and he's also like, he can sword fight and everything quite well, but he's always kind of drunk, and he, he's kind of clumsy, even though he's brilliant, and, 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 and he still manages to make things work out for him. He's kind of like Archer, where, like, yeah. he, he does awful things that ruin everybody's lives, but, like, he comes out smelling like a rose. He still finds a way to come out of it, you know what I mean, most of the time. Yeah. Um, and he's so full of himself, and he's just so funny. Like, Jack Sparrow is one of those characters, I feel like, 
I really enjoyed the first two movies. I didn't think the third one was very good at all. I, I thought the fourth one was okay, and I never saw the fifth one. But I still yeah. will see the fifth one eventually because I love him. Like, if he's in a movie, I will see it. Like, he's kind of like my spirit animal in terms of just, like, not giving a sh- – well, he does care. He just – he's very <laughs> – He's very free with everything he does. Yeah. And I'm not like that. Like, you know, I'm the guy that, like, even when I do direct shorts and stuff, I'm known for being – I'm the pre-production director. I like to plan everything out. You know, when yeah. I have a schedule, I, I stick to it more just because it gives me less anxiety to stick to my schedule. You know, mm-hmm. things like that. So just being so freeing and whatever happens, happens, and we'll figure it out. And he's, like, the epitome of that, like, in the most divine way that, like, I just love yep. him. Like, I love him so much. So – Jack Sparrow awesome. is a good one. That's a good choice. And you're <laughs> right. That, he really makes those movies special. And that he was does. Uh, that was the last. Uh, I could be wrong on this, but that was the end of like the swashbuckling genre. We don't kind get of. swashbucklers like Pirates yeah. of the Caribbean or Princess Bride or like anything like that anymore. That was well, those and those out. were the first in a while when they started yeah. Pirates. Those were kind of the first in a while. Well, not really because I mean, outside of that, they had the whole Black Sails on Stars. It was a TV show. It had like four or five seasons, I think, and I heard it was good. I don't. But I haven't it, seen it. It's not just Pirates. It's Pirates and like so you scoundrels mean that style. and adventurers. You yeah, know you mean, I mean that like style. It was the end of that okay yeah. okay yeah for sure i think it was like the only series that did it like you said yeah like it mm-hmm. like it brought it back for that style and that humor and that um kind of still being kind of family style but also being you know having some mis- mystery to it and a lot and then it went very uh supernatural in a lot of ways which was really cool you know like yeah I mean, yeah yeah for sure like yeah. and then they were fun movies for the most part the first two were great i thought um I thought the third one was, like I said, you know, <laughs> but, but if Jack's mm-hmm. in them, I'll see them anyway, because he'll be great. You know, it's true. Exactly. Like, I, I just will, like, it's like how you feel about the family in the Fast and the Furious movies. <laughs> oh, no, I'll miss one. I'll miss one every now and then, I'm sure. <laughs> that last one, I, that last one, my God. <laughs> I know, they're, they're, they're corny. They're really corny. But, okay. Man. Okay, hang on. Uh, Is this the last one? I got one more for you. Okay, so this, uh, that's actually kind of funny because one of my questions is similar to yours, but slightly different. So I'm going to ask you. No, I'm gonna well, how, ask, about you do, how about you do this one? I'll do my last one and then you do one more. Okay, so this okay. one's going to be, it's going to seem like a counter to yours, okay. but it's not because it's a little different. All right. So if you were a character in a film, who do you think that you're most like uh... <laughs> in real life, in real life? Stevie in Shit's Creek. <laughs> is that the son? <laughs> no, that's the uh Which the woman who Oh uh, oh oh yeah the one who the, runs uh, the hotel, uh, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like Dude, I, I can totally see that. I can totally see that. Like one hundred percent. I can uh, totally see that. Only because I'm watching it right now. Whenever I see like her interact, I'm like, Jesus, is that like a clone? Like what is going on? <laughs> <laughs> I feel, I, I, I feel like I go back and forth between being Stevie and like uh uh the sun. Yeah. Depending uh, on my mood or day. <laughs> it's just yeah. like, or the situation. I'll be like, oh come on, just freaking deal with it. Other times I'll be like, I'm not touching that. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> yeah, her, her dry sarcasm and she's her fantastic. Just complete never breaking monotone. Yeah. Did yes, you finish uh, it? No, not yet. I think I'm on <laughs> season three. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's um, it. That's a great show. I got caught up with uh, with Midnight Mass and Squid Game, and then I also For watched sure. uh, I watched The Many Saints in New York today, which was pretty solid. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. Um, but Maya actually, in the vein of finishing those, and this is kind of a selfish question and a kind of good finale question i'm curious what's next on your watch list what are the things that you've been waiting to get around to that you plan to watch soon oh my god okay so as i said before the new scream matrix resurrections um those are one no it has to be out oh it has to be out already oh so like movies that are on my watch list that i haven't seen that i want to yeah what's what's like what do you think will be next um well, currently I'm watching Squid Game right now, so that's going to be happening. We'll talk uh, about that one. I finished mm-hmm. it last night. We, we, we definitely will. Yeah. Um, what else? My God, like I have a few things. 
I'm just trying to figure out what I'm actually going to watch next because I have a big list. Uh, yeah. There are some movies that I have never seen that I've always wanted to. Like, I, I have a feeling soon I'm going to watch Paul Thomas Anderson's Magnolia. I've still never seen Ooh. that. It's yeah, a great movie. Like, 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 that's one I've never seen that I've Julianne wanted to Moore see. Julianne Moore in that movie is incredible. Yeah, and then recently I was I was realizing I wanted to see more Ang Lee films, and I've actually never seen Brokeback Mountain, so I'll probably watch that. Yeah. Um, I'll probably watch. Uh, I really want to see. There's a. Hang on a second. It's called. Give me a second. There is a. I think it's a Chinese film. Um, I. It might be Wong Kar Wai. Uh, it's like in the, the eyes of. Ah, uh, it's gonna kill me. Hang on a second. Yep. While I'm looking, why don't you tell me some that you're going to see? Um, let's see. I'm going to check out Cry Macho, because I saw it on uh, like the HBO watch list. That's uh, mm-hmm. Clint Eastwood's newly directed movie. In the Mood um, for Love. In the Mood for Love. That's it. That's on HBO, too, actually. Yeah, In the Mood for Love. It's fine. I think it is finally yeah. on HBO, and it's one that's been on my list for a while, so that's one of the reasons why I'm going to watch it. In the Mood for Love is one I'm going to watch. Yeah, my my next few. I'm gonna watch Prime Macho. Um, they just. I want to watch the new animated movies. Uh, the Batman Long Halloween Part One and Part Two. Okay. Um, and I was right. It's 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 a Wong Kar Wai. Wong Kar Wai. So, yeah, he's um, he, he direct. He's directed it. And then I will he, probably get around to watching. Uh, it's a uh, coming up on October. Yes, I'm so gonna be watching I'm, a lot of horrors too. <laughs> I'm gonna be watching a lot of horrors. I might watch Hill House again. Um, okay. And I'm gonna try to hit up some classic horror movies that I know I haven't seen. Like I might watch Suspiria. Oh, that's actually yeah. another one that I'll be watching because it's Halloween. I it's something I don't tell people because I love horror and I haven't seen it. I've never seen the. I've seen pieces of it, so I feel like I've seen the whole thing, but I've never huh. seen the entirety of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So oh, I'm gonna be wa- movie, I'm gonna be watching that very soon. What? That movie's so brutal. It's yeah. so ahead of its time. And it's oh so yeah. Freaking, like, Just the scenes out. I've seen, I'm always blown away by the. It's another film that I would say visceral as fuck. <laughs> like it yeah. seems like, and it seems like the sound design is amazing too. I've seen um, the ending scene. I've seen some of the murder scenes. I just haven't seen the whole movie. I need to just watch it, and I want to. So That's yeah. Another one. And then. Um... Do I have anything else that I've been wanting to watch? Uh, you're you're not gonna like this, Forge. And there are a couple movies that I've been wanting to watch. Why I've would I wanting... judge you? I won't judge you. You will. I've been uh, getting ready to revisit Rob Zombie's Halloween One and Two. That's fine. <laughs> enjoy. I, I, hope I, <laughs> I hope you enjoy. I hope you enjoy. Why why would I judge you for that? I hope you enjoy. Sure. <laughs> I I. Yeah. Um, I think that Michael Myers looks the scariest. Yeah, he's pretty I, you know? big in that movie. <laughs> and he's brutal. And he's brutal. He's gigantic. Yeah. They um, didn't just turn him into a Michael Myers killer. He's a freaking giant chasing after you. It's horrifying. <laughs> it's <really laughs> it's horrifying. Um, and I might, uh, I might watch a lot of the Halloween series because they're about to mm-hmm. put out the the sequel to, you know, yeah, the sequel Halloween, Halloween kills. We're going to see. We're going to uh, see so, it this Saturday, this weekend, the, with my friend from work. So the uh, direct sequel to Halloween. Yeah, Halloween, kill. and yeah, the direct kill. sequel to the sequel of Halloween <laughs> called Halloween, called Halloween Kills. <laughs> no, it's called Killer Halloween. Get, 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 get it through your head. <laughs> like... Who is titling this? The same guy who did <laughs> Carnage. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, hang on. So my final question for you, I'm going to combine it with two things because one was to, one I told was the only question I told you I was going to ask. And that okay. seems like, uh, so, um, what drives you day to day? And then the second part is, is there anything you would like to say to the audience before we leave? Okay. What drives me day to day? Um, uh, a couple things. So my wedding day. Uh, the vision of that and having to uh, to fund it, uh, you know, my my fiance and I is is a huge driver to to get my work done and be highly successful in it. Also, pushing that vision out, being able to have a uh, have a home, uh, have a family, be yes. able to travel as we want to, uh, and still find the time to enjoy my hobbies. 
um, those kind of visions drive me day to day. Um, and also just my, my natural <clears throat> enjoyment of life, I think. Um, even when it gets hard, I've been able to, you know, experience such deep emotions in so many different ways that the, yeah. the idea of feeling things like that again are very exciting to me. Nice. Um, so I'm just a natural kind of lo- lover of life. I want to I feel things, see things, hear, smell, touch, all of, all of those things. Nice. Um, if I had to say anything to the subscribers. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm new to podcasts. Like subscribers, listeners, viewers. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, but yeah. Just, uh, but y'all, y'all out there that we love. <laughs> yeah, I would say um, that's broad. It's like it's hard for me to imagine everyone. So I'll, I'll say it to myself and others. How about that? That might be a little more honest. Sure. Um, you know, there are so many things that we get the opportunity to enjoy or have an opinion about or experience. And I would say to everybody and myself, no matter what you enjoy, uh, there are going to be people who have an opinion about it, this, that, and the third. So be comfortable and confident being yourself enjoying what you enjoy there will be others who are in that community as well seek them out create your own little community within the people who enjoy what you enjoy and pursue happiness because if you miss that opportunity time will pass you by and you may never know what that feels like very nice and for those serial killers out there who are following all of that advice please don't make us one of your victims you know, people, that's the thing with words, especially when they're not I can't control how people take what I say. <laughs> it's great advice, I'm just saying. Boy. I'm just saying in advance, uh, you Guys, know. Guys, like, I do, I do love stepping on babies. There's I appreciate probably someone else the... who also loves stepping on babies. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, I appreciate not you. There's I probably psychological reasonings why you are the way you are, and I don't condone them, but you know, just please don't let us be one of your, your choices. Like, that'd be great. Or, or anyone else. <laughs> or, yeah, yeah. Or, or anyone else, <laughs> just especially not me. <laughs> also, also, one more thing. Sure. Listen more than you speak. Yes. Seek I'm understanding. Terrible at that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I feel like having a podcast is making it worse. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I suppose the better way, the better way to say that would be seek understanding. No, I think that's good. I was just messing yeah. with you. That's very, very good advice. <laughs> See, Dylan's the wise one. I just, just like see. to play fighting and play fighting games. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for the next Mortal Kombat. Mortal Kombat 12. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe in Justice right. 3. We'll see. Yeah. I know we're uh, wrapping up here, but um, I'm going to throw that one back to you. What, what would you like to tell the people? Oh, I have to follow that. That's just hard. Ah. I just want to be like, Durr, you guys are awesome. I love you. <laughs> I don't know if I love you. Thanks for listening. I don't know you. <laughs> um, I, I would honestly just like to say that um, I'm really appreciative of everyone who does tune into this podcast. Um, I hope that like our conversations are very interesting to you because I know that I really enjoy having them with Dylan and I have for quite a few years now. Um, and also just being able to commit to something like this where I really get to, you know, discuss something with my friends. And um, I have heard some feedback from some of you that's really, really cool. Um, that's really interesting. So um, it just kind of makes me feel like I'm putting my thoughts out there, which is also why I made my YouTube channel and why I called it a restless mind, because I feel like I have all these thoughts that, I feel like I, I have an opinion on things or I have things that I want to talk about. And for years, I didn't talk about them. I just kept them to myself or just talked to a friend about them and it didn't feel like enough. Um, and this for me is very therapeutic. And also I like the idea of doing any kind of art that creates a dialogue, that creates a discussion among people because I think those are really good. Um, so doing this has allowed me to do that. And I'm just grateful for those of you that tune in. So um, kind of similar to what Dylan said, even if it's not art, if you just have something that you think that you're good at or something that you think that there isn't enough of, or you just have a unique perspective on it, um, 
there are a thousand mediums that you can use to um, convey that information to just tell people or to, you know, trigger conversation or maybe you like to ask questions, you know, but there, there are a thousand different mediums that you can use to do all that. And um, what this podcast has taught me, though, is that you might not know what you're doing when you start. <laughs> you might feel like you're figuring it all out, but that's okay. Everyone does. So when you start, just keep going. And as you do it, you'll just get better and better, hopefully. <laughs> uh, and you're just putting out the content that you want to put out. So that's it for me, really. Awesome. We hope you enjoy it, guys. Definitely, guys. Uh, and we will see you next time. We have some interesting ideas cooking. I don't know what, which one we'll go with yet, but we will see. So I'm sure it will y'all. be something Halloween-ish. <laughs> probably since we're getting towards that time we're gonna have some kind of horror themed or spookiness i don't know we'll find out but Sweet. thank you everybody for joining us today on some discussion all right thanks everyone have a great night have a good night all